Good morning, everyone. I think now it works. Uh, very welcome to SEPS. I'm uh, really pleased to um, have you here today at, at SEPS for, for this event, um, which is organized in cooperation with the European University Institute and uh, linked to the uh, EAST project. I'm sure you will hear much more uh, about this uh, uh, throughout the day. So um, I'm Cinzia Cidi, I'm Director of Research, and uh, I would like just to, to say a few opening words, um, essentially trying to put um, uh, into question uh, the, the, the big issue that will be discussed today, which is uh, really about uh, EU-Asia relations uh, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, by the way, some of you may have seen uh, uh, this morning in the Financial Times, there is uh, an article about the, the role of, of China and uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, development aid uh, policy in, uh, in the region. So this is certainly a very topical issue. Um, as an introductory word, um, I'm not an expert on security. I'm an economist by, by training. And I think uh, in, in the last uh, uh, now several months, we have been discussed two broad issues, which uh, I think work as, as, as a framework for the discussion of today. The first one is uh, globalization and what is going on with globalization. Um, in the economic circles, uh, there, there is a lot of concern that uh, after globalization, we are moving into deglobalization, and uh, what this could mean for uh, for the EU. The EU is uh, made of trading nations, so what happens to trade is certainly of great importance to us. But I think it's important also to um, recognize that uh, globalization is not only about trade; it's also about financial integration and uh, movements of, of capital. Uh, and we should not forget that the EU is one of the main sources and uh, um, recipient of uh, uh, investment, global investment. The second um, issue, if you want, which I think is uh, extremely topical uh, today and is linked to the debate of today, is the idea of strategic autonomy. Uh, which um, I think is something uh, uh, that we will hear um, a lot of in uh, the upcoming months, uh, probably, um, years. And uh, um, I think that the question is very crucial because uh, uh, the prosperity of the EU, at least this is my view, uh, of the last years has relied a lot on a system which is rule-based. And this system is definitely, uh, d definitely under threat. And uh, uh, we are in a, a very contested, contested world where uh, the rule have uh, left the place to uh, the race for power. Uh, and uh, um, uh, essentially the, the e US uh, China uh, race for uh, technological um, leadership uh, has generated a new uh, global context in which uh, the, the EU needs to find its place. Uh, and I think the discussion of, of today falls perfectly in this context, looking at very specific regions, which is not necessarily a region where the EU uh, has a strong presence. By contrast, it's mostly a place for, for trade rather than uh, for presence. So um, I would like to, to, to stop it here and uh, to not to, to take any time uh, to, to the other presenters. Uh, there is a small change in the program. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, uh, Giulio Pugliese uh, from the European University Institute and Oxford, and I leave the floor to, to him. Uh, many thanks and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcidi, if uh, possible. Yes, thank you. I <coughs> I am first and foremost uh, uh, grateful to the collaboration uh, we've had uh, with, uh, of course, Thomas Christensen. I'm speaking in my personal capacity as Giulio Pugliese. You would see in a second that I will act as Thomas Christensen's uh, avatar, unfortunately, uh, so to speak. Uh, he is uh, unable to join us today. But first and foremost, let me thank uh, Stefania Benaglia, the head uh, of uh, Global Connectivity at SEPS, uh, and Thomas uh, for jointly co-organizing uh, this uh, dissemination event, which is first and foremost led uh, by Thomas's project, uh, Jean Monnet Project East, uh, but it's in conjunction with uh, 
new projects specific to uh, Europe and EU-Asia relations at the European University Institute and at SEPS. And uh, it falls very much in line with, doc with what Dr. Alcidi has mentioned, uh, the uh, remit of our researchers. The fact that no matter whether you're mostly looking at, you're looking at uh, trade, uh, security and uh, politics and politicisa politicization and the growing uh, uh, importance of values, uh, whatever and however you want to define values, whether it's labor standards, uh, universal values, or even actually nationalistic values, <coughs> uh, are going to impact more and more uh, the uh, economic interactions uh, throughout the Eurasian uh, uh, continent, uh, both in trade and finance. So what I'll do today is that I'll present very briefly uh, the uh, outputs of uh, the project, and I'll have to ask uh, either for either a pointer to turn my slides on my own or to mimic it. <laughs> so <clears throat> this project uh, has been a, a mixed blessing, as it, were, as it were, because it has happened at a momentous time of uh, transition and change in EU-Asia relations. And uh, I am now, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, acting as Thomas Avatar, because this is uh, Thomas Christensen's led Jean Monnet project. And the EAST uh, uh, acronym stands for Europe, Asia, Security and Trade. The project was launched uh, in September 2018, <clears throat> and it was scheduled to complete in August 2021, but uh, as you all know, the pandemic has effectively delayed uh, uh, some of the deliverables, including the dissemination activities such as this one. Uh, but it's uh, a mammoth project uh, encompassing uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific, uh, as it were, from uh, research um, institutions, uh, both think tanks and academic institutions in Europe, uh, to the equivalents uh, in, uh, in East Asia and Australia. And this mix has allowed also for conceptual clarity, uh, academic contributions, along with uh, uh, um, uh, timely uh, topics uh, that have been uh, potentially of interest to policymakers, and as you will see today, they will be of interest uh, to our distinguished members of the audience today as well. Um, uh, yes, digital uh, transition, uh, please, uh, at CEPS as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we will have. Uh, uh, no, sorry, it's, it's, an, it's another slide. Uh, and I have this problem myself uh, very much uh, in, uh, 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 in my own, uh, in my own, uh, <laughs> my own merits in Oxford <laughs> and UI. It's a, it's a digital transition it has been indeed uh, a challenge, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the pandemic. But <clears throat> what, is, what is of interest uh, is to uh, see the fact that the project has entailed uh, two uh, major outputs from uh, renowned uh, publishers of international affairs, meaning Palgrave Macmillan, and this has resulted in two big books, one of them uh, <coughs> uh, co-edited by Thomas, and the other one co-edited by Johan Argensen and Eugeni Posnikov, uh, who will uh, join us today. And the, the uh, approach of this book uh, of these two books uh, has encompassed uh, really an interdisciplinary dialogue uh, between a variety of experts, not just between think tanks and academia, but also <clears throat> between a variety of ontological, and if you want, if you must, uh, epistemological traditions in the approach to the study of uh, uh, Europe-Asia relations, uh, from uh, area study specialists uh, to uh, security and trade specialists. And, the project has avoided Eurocentrism. It has uh, uh, often uh, uh, entailed the coordination and collaboration between European uh, and authors from the region. And it has encompassed a variety of conferences spanning, again, the Indo-Pacific, uh, from Melbourne to Singapore, Berlin and Rome, and lastly also uh, here in Brussels uh, and uh, um, throughout the um, consortium members. We had a very fruitful discussion also in Florence uh, for my program, for my project uh, uh, a month ago. Uh, please. Next slide, please. 
these are the books, uh, and I invite you all to uh, 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 have a look at them. Please, next slide. And this uh, uh, project has, however, been impacted uh, by the very uh, fast-moving, fast-paced, uh, fast-paced uh, change in uh, <coughs> uh, global politics, uh, specifically with uh, uh, by not taking fully into account uh, the impact of the global pandemic, which we are still discussing nowadays, what is the ultimate fallout of the pandemic. It's probably too early still uh, to have uh, a proper assessment of, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The project has also encountered uh, uh, as a moving target the rapid deterioration of EU-China relations and its last month's news uh, um, the leak of a uh, European External Action Service uh, memo aimed at uh, um, heads of the executives and uh, uh, members of uh, the European Union, of the EU Council, where, whereas the European External Action Service understands now China, especially solely as a strategic competitor. So this is indeed a moving target. And of course, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine has also uh, been, uh, not been taken fully into account into, into this project. Uh, because of course publication uh, takes, uh, takes a, long, uh, a long while. Um, the project, however, has recognized uh, the uh, important trends and important factors underpinning uh, the European Union's uh, engagement, both security and trade-wise, uh, with the region by looking at, for instance, the relevance and role of US-China strategic competition and the relevance of the United States of America in the region and also vis-a-vis -vis the uh, European, uh, uh, European players and European Union. And the project is uh, somewhat original in its emphasis uh, on cooperation rather than on conflict. And this is part and parcel, you might say, actually, of uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, of uh, the European Union's uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which entails cooperation with like-minded players. And so, in a sense, uh, it has forewarned also um, policy outputs uh, uh, within Europe. Next slide, please. Um, this is a byproduct uh, of uh, earlier projects uh, led by Thomas and uh, Emil, who is a co editor of the security book, uh, Emil Kirchner, who will be chairing the next panel, uh, focusing on EU China and EU Japan relations. And the focus has been uh, uh, especially on East Asia, defined as Northeast and Southeast Asia, with individual country studies. But also uh, by taking into account uh, Australia, of course, uh, and uh, interregional relations, so to speak, between the EU and ASEAN, who, which are facing uh, uh, a growing momentum, as it were. Uh, of course, the role of external players has been taken into account, the US, Russia uh, uh, in particular. And uh, next slide, please. And what has been interesti interesting is has been uh, the um, uh, focus uh, on uh, the comparative angle between these set of EU-Asia relations, but also the, uh, uh, you might say, um, comparative angle not just uh, in space but in time and how uh, you, you have seen an evolution of, uh, Europe, of the European Union's engagement in the region. Um, and there has been a focus not just on traditional security threats, which we have been talking about more recently, and the securitization also <coughs> of, uh, of trade links, but also of non-traditional security threats, uh, with uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a matrix-style uh, aggregation of research findings across the various countries and security dimensions. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a uh, broad... Uh, uh, a broad overview of uh, the security angles that have been covered. You will get in the second panel, <coughs> specific to trade, uh, an overview and an introduction to the geoeconomic volume, as it were. Um, uh, this is a, a, big, a big remit, and in fact, uh, the volume is quite thick, and I encourage you all to get in touch with the authors and to have a copy of, uh, and to have a look at the copy of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the books, please. Yes, next slide, please, thank you. And the research findings uh, have actually found that 
Um, yes, common, and percep common perceptions and norm congruence, so the emphasis on shared values, uh, do not necessarily translate into high levels of interregional convergence and cooperation. So we have to scrape the surface uh, of rhetorical commitments uh, to uh, the so-called international rules-based order uh, or our common uh, uh, universal values shared with like-minded players, as it were, and I'm trying to echo as many uh, catchphrases as possible, uh, as it were, between, for instance, the EU and uh, Japan or the EU and, uh, and uh, the Republic of Korea. How does that actually translate operationally and practically into uh, de facto real cooperation? That is something that we need to take into account. Even connectivity, for instance, and this is me speaking, uh, has been uh, uh, the target of uh, a lot of uh, uh, papers and a lot of also partnerships, for instance, notably first and foremost with Japan and India, but we, we have operating frameworks that need still to be fleshed out. So we have to go beyond the rhetorics uh, of shared values and uh, commitments to, uh, to the global commons with like-minded players to see how actually cooperation takes place. Um, and the cooperation has been hampered by the EU focus on non-traditional security dimensions uh, while Asian counterparts uh, have uh, been looking especially at traditional security. This is uh, uh, an interesting development because the European Union has actually now tried to buttress up uh, and show the flag uh, as, a, uh, 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 as a provider also of security goods to the region, uh, for instance, through maritime security or through the... Uh, enhancing security cooperation in and with Asia uh, project. And uh, uh, still, uh, according to uh, Thomas-led uh, project finding, Europe's uh, regional approach to security has not matched the situation in Asia. So what we have seen is actually strong cooperation in uh, softer security aspects, such as uh, economic security, and uh, I might add also maritime safety and non-traditional security, uh, non-traditional security uh, threats. But increasingly, the, as, as has been recognized by Dr. Alcidi at the beginning, the situation defined by US-China strategic competition and China's aggressiveness, if not assertive, if assertiveness, not aggressiveness, has been growing defined by traditional security threats. Uh, as it has been, of course, in Europe uh, with Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, and then last but not least, uh, uh, we've had uh, a negative impact of Brexit on EU capabilities and networks in Asia. Now, this has been Thomas' project, a uh, Thomas-led uh, uh, project. In the next two slides, I will very shortly introduce you to a new project uh, uh, inaugurated uh, through the support of Japan Foundation at the European University Institute in January of 2021, and that is the EU Asia project. I uh, have uh, <coughs> the privilege, uh, well, quote unquote, because uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very much overworked uh, by wearing multiple hats, both at YAI, which is a consortium partner member of, uh, of uh, the East project, uh, but also as an academic uh, at Oxford focusing on Japanese politics uh, and as co-lead of the EU-Asia project uh, at EU, I have the privilege of, of, lead, of co-leading it with Ken Endo. The EU-Asia project uh, has been looking uh, uh, at uh, the similar trends, that the similar issues that uh, we have spoken about uh, uh, so far, but with a focus uh, on uh, the security component, uh, uh, traditional security uh, in particular, and uh, if you want the uh, securitization and the politicization uh, um, of uh, uh, economic, uh, financial, trade uh, uh, links across, uh, across Asia. Um, the project is hosted uh, by uh, the Robert Schuman Center, specifically the Global Gover Governance Program. And uh, it has also a side wing uh, at the newly inaugurated uh, <coughs> uh, School of Transnational Governance, where we have a module uh, aimed at MA students there. But it's part and parcel uh, really aimed at sky, uh, uh, blue sky research, uh, academic research, uh, with a policy angle. And I invite you all to have a look at the website because uh, there is a, a big list uh, of uh, uh, research outputs, uh, policy papers, policy briefs uh, on aspects uh, encompassing uh, uh, 
the impact of US-China strategic competition and of the pandemic uh, on regional value chains, all the way to the growing relevance uh, of, uh, uh, of values impacting on Europe-Asia relations. Okay, sorry. And I would uh, want to uh, uh, show you the next slide and conclude. I will, uh, I will also invite you, I would also invite you to have a look at the uh, YouTube channel. We just had uh, a video posted uh, uh, this week uh, on, uh, oddly enough, Japan, China, US power politics, uh, which was hosted in the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's visit uh, to Taiwan and of, of course, of China's saber rattling uh, following her visit in August uh, of this year. And we have the good fortune of involving uh, academics and policy practitioners uh, spanning not just uh, uh, Europe, but also East Asia and the United States of America. Because this is part and parcel of the conversation we should be having. We should really be having a conversation of where our interests uh, uh, also coincide and diverge. Uh, and what do we mean when we are trying to look at geopolitical competition also through the lenses of, of values? Because, and this is to add a layer of complexity that I invite you uh, to, to follow also through the European Union, uh, through the European University Institute's uh, EU Asia project. Uh, I see, to conclude, uh, the growing relevance of geopolitical competition and uh, of uh, um, um, growing, uh, growing security, security uh, threats perceptions and threat security threats in the region as being impinged uh, and running a bit in opposite directions uh, by, yes, Universal, the growing relevance of universal values, meaning uh, <coughs> labor rights, uh, democratic uh, values, human rights, but also increasingly nationalism. And we should be talking about the growing relevance of nationalism that feeds actually into a, um, um, a reformulation and a recalibration of uh, value chains, uh, of the scramble for critical technologies and for obtaining first mover advantage in uh, uh, high-end technology at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, which sees interests not necessarily aligned within the EU and between the EU and so-called like-minded players. So we should be keep in mind also the fact that the situation on the ground is much more complicated uh, than the bipolarism uh, that we're often presented uh, in, mainstream, uh, in mainstream media. Um, and uh, with uh, that uh, uh, somber, uh, with that somber uh, assessment, if you want, I uh, am very thankful again for SEPS, and uh, I look forward uh, to a very fruitful uh, one-day discussion <laughs> and conversation on uh, uh, these aspects. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, receiving uh, the keynote speech uh, by the Deputy Director uh, at DG Trade, uh, uh, which I assume will be uh, introduced by, uh, by SEPS. Uh, yes? Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to, to, to invite uh, Maria Martin Pratt to, to give us the, the keynote speech, please. from uh, the point of view of our trade and economic policies, which is uh, the area that I am responsible for and following the Commission. Uh, but I would like very quickly to highlight how economic engagement brings as well an engagement that goes beyond uh, trade policy and economies generally. I think one should never underestimate the strength that having for instance, a free trade agreement gives to our relations and cooperation with our partners. Now, 
I'm sure you're going to discuss it at length during the day. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is an area of growing, growing importance, both as regards the economy, as regards the population, and as regards uh, the political weight and importance it has. We're talking about 60% of the world population, 60% of global GDP, and a region that contributed two-thirds of pre-pandemic global economic growth uh, and is at the forefront of the digital economy. We are also talking about a region that includes key players to shape the international order and to address uh, global challenges, and that includes as well climate change. Now, one thing that is often forgotten is how important are the trade and investment relationships between the EU and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the EU is the top investor, the leading provider of development cooperation, and one of the biggest trading partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, together, the region uh, of the Indo-Pacific and the European Union account for over 70% of the global trade in goods and services, and over 60% of foreign direct investment flows. Um, the trade exchanges between these two regions are higher than between any other geographical regions in the world, with annual trade that reaches uh, 1.5 trillion uh, in terms of exchanges uh, back in 2019. Uh, it is the second largest destination of our <laughs> exports and home to four of our 10 top biggest trading partners, that is China, Japan, South Korea, and India. All this is to, to, to put in context, uh, the, 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 in context the importance that the region has for us, even if at first sight you may think it is geographically uh, remote uh, as far as uh, the location of, of those countries as compared to, to Europe. We did adopt it uh, at the beginning of, of this commission um, a new strategy for the Indo-Pacific region, well, not at the beginning, it was only back last year, uh, which does reflect the importance uh, that the region has for us and, and included a very ambitious and clear trade agenda. At the time, it was welcome, uh, and I think continues to be welcomed by countries of in the regions as also a demonstration of the refocus of, of, of Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, uh, this region. Now, what did we include from a trade angle in, in that agenda? First of all, uh, the effective implementation, and, and this is something that we devote a lot of time to, of our existing FTAs in the region, and those are very important ones. Uh, is the one we have with Japan, the one we have with Korea, with Singapore and with Vietnam. And as I was saying uh, at the beginning of my intervention, these are agreements that frame economic relations, allow us to discuss issues such as trade and sustainable development, are a tool of real engagement with, with those countries. We will also now be uh, in the process of ensuring the ratification of another uh, free trade agreement that we concluded in the area, specifically the one uh, with New Zealand, and are in the midst of negotiations with Australia, with India, <coughs> and with Indonesia. Uh, we also continue our close relations with ASEAN and are assessing whether we will resume uh, trade discussions with three other of the members of ASEAN. This is Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. Now, traditional FTAs are not the only means we have to engage in the region. Uh, for instance, as regards ASEAN, uh, we have recently agreed to start working on specific areas where we may have common um, interest uh, related to sustainable development, green transition, and, and digital. And specifically on digital, which is one of the areas with a uh, 
is one of the areas where a number of countries in the region play uh, a greater role. Uh, we have started discussions on what we call our digital partnership agreements. Uh, we <coughs> have started discussing what we can do in terms of cooperation on digital infrastructures, skills, digital transformation of businesses and digitization of public services. And within those uh, digital partnership agreements, we also discuss uh, digital trade principles. Now, there is one of such digital partnership agreements that was concluded already in May this year, is the one with Japan. And uh, we hope to conclude before the end of this year the ones that we have been discussing with Korea and with Singapore. These are framework principles to discuss with these countries, but they are also, in our view, stepping stones to decide whether we want to also engage into the negotiations of binding rules in the uh, sphere of digital trade. We are already in the process of uh, having one of such negotiations. <coughs> uh, we recently launch, launched negotiations with Japan on data flows. Uh, data flows is an area which is essential for digital trade, which was not covered by our economic partnership agreement at the time it was concluded, but where we have taken a commitment to revisit the matter and to start negotiations when the time was right for it, which is what we have started now. Um, again, what I'm trying as well to highlight here is that there are different ways to engage with the countries in the region and that sometimes we are looking into more targeted and in some cases more agile forms of engagement also in view of the fact that uh, we do see the rulemaking process going very fast in some of the countries in the region and also among some of the countries in the region. We want to be participant in, in those discussions. Uh, Europe has a long tradition of being a rule setter rather than a rule taker and we don't want to have a different role in the digital front. Now, let me <coughs> say a word about our relations with, with China difficult not to talk about the Indo-Pacific and not to mention it. Uh, I think you will not be surprised <coughs> if I say that our relations are, are being tested uh, in view of the broader geopolitical context uh, and that our um, multi-pronged approach to China, the famous uh, trilogy of uh, partner, competitor, rival <coughs> is still valid, is still valid but it is correct to say that besides cooperation, the part on competition and rivalry is, is coming to the fore increasingly in some instances. Um, our strategy vis-a-vis -vis China st starts as well at home in the sense that we were mindful of the need to have a strong internal market and we are mindful as well of the need to have the tools in place to defend um, our security, the integrity of our internal market in terms of a level playing field and also our values. At the same time, even in a um, political context that may be more challenging, I think it is very clear to say that our trade flows with China remain robust and that we continue to think engagement uh, is, is necessary, not least because of our economic ties, but also in view to uh, protecting our economic interests in China, building a more balanced and reciprocal, reciprocal trade and investment relation with the country, and also because we believe we have common responsibilities to shape joint responses to global economic and trade challenges. <coughs> um, again, what I'm giving you is, is, is a very broad picture of our relations with, with the region that is uh, very varied in terms of the country's economic situations and geopolitical placement. Um, there is a lot happening in, in 
in, in the region. There is a lot of uh, attention that is being focused by the European Union uh, to the region, and that includes a renewed trade agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are running uh, one minute slightly <coughs> delayed, but do you still have time for one quick round of questions? Yes, thank you. So we will collect, but actually I will first abuse with having the microphone and asking my own question. <laughs> Sorry for this. And then, so actually what I wanted to ask you is about India and FTA. Um, we had some, uh, started the negotiation with the expectation that it will be smooth and they will be concluded by the end of 2023. So I was wondering if this assumption still holds today and what is the process, the state of play of this negotiation? And actually two questions uh, regarding the Trade and Technology Council, which was adopted uh, a little more than six months ago, but it was announced at the highest level, but we still, it, the potential of this council is so high that we of course are all waiting to see what it will be the actual mandate of this council. So the question, the second one was, uh, when will we see the mandate of this council? And then I, perhaps we collect them all first. Thank you. Uh, Kurt Geisert, I'm one of the guides in the House of European History. You mentioned ASEAN. Um, in January, uh, Indonesia will take over the presidency of ASEAN. Uh, are you optimistic as far as the, the relationship uh, with ASEAN next year uh, is concerned, given the experience of Bali? Thank you. Just talking about <coughs> ASEAN, my name is Wolfgang Papp. I'm speaking as an individual here. I wonder, at the very beginning, the EU was supporting very much the integration in ASEAN. It has not progressed very much, even the economic community is not very far so, f uh, so far. But the EU tried from the very beginning to have an FTA with ASEAN as such. And some people feel that the individual FTAs with member countries, or should I even say member nations of ASEAN, are still a kind of divide and rule because they're not all the same. Do you still f feel there should be sooner or later an FTA with ASEAN? Is that possible at all? Thank you. Thank you. I think at this point there are no other questions. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the questions in the order that came. As regards negotiations with India, they are ongoing. There is not such a thing as a smooth trade negotiation. They never are. They are complex matters, and I don't think anyone entering into the negotiations with India in the thought that it will be an easy process. There is a political objective, and and one that we continue to invest in, uh, we are now in in what starts being the, the court of, of, of the negotiations and, and hope to be able to advance them. Whether they will be at the stage that allows for completion at the, at the end of next year is something that remains to be seen, but certainly it will not be for lack of engagement on the side of the European Union. As regards the Trade and Technology Council, the Trade and Technology Council is a process. Um, and, and it's a process uh, that uh, we believe uh, has, has importance uh, to deal with matters that are not necessarily covered by FTAs or not necessarily backed uh, in full, uh, not necessarily in full. And, and very often what we try to, to cover is the nexus you increasingly have between trade, technology, and security. Uh, so these are discussions that go well beyond um, what we will include in a trade agreement, uh, for instance, by having uh, discussions and cooperation on issues such as the screen of foreign direct investment or, investment or export controls. On, on ASEAN, the European Union has not uh, given up the idea of a region to region free trade agreement. But it is correct to say that so far we have not had the l common commitment for a level an of ambition that will justify resuming such negotiations. They are not uh, forgotten uh, precisely to see how to advance our relations with the region as a whole we have now renewed our commitment in terms of discussions on specific issues such as digital or green. 
and bilateral engagement with countries in the region does not exclude a regional engagement. I think it acknowledges the fact that we're talking about very different countries with different level of ambition and readiness to engage in uh, a trade agreement. It's not the same if we're talking about uh, negotiations with some of, 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 of the countries uh, in ASEAN as, 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 as compared to others. So in that respect, um, having a commonality, because very often uh, in our free trade agreements we have common uh, rules that you will find all of them. Uh, for instance, if we were to advance with Indonesia, uh, if we were to resume with Malaysia or with Thailand, it helps into uh, what we believe uh, should continue to be of interest for both parties. But as I say, one thing does not exclude the other while acknowledging that at, the point, at this point, uh, the ambition for region-to-region -region, uh, agreement, one that will have the level that we think <coughs> is required, is, is, is not been there. Uh, and, and of course, we do have um, uh, all the uh, all the hope to have a successful uh, chairmanship now uh, of, of of ASEAN for this upcoming year. As I said, uh, I see uh, our recent contacts with with ASEAN as ones that have restate uh, restart uh, our discussions. Uh, one that I think is uh, should be conducive to to a greater degree of working together, even in the absence of negotiations for a region-to-region -region agreement. So I'm optimistic in that respect. Thank you very much. I, well, um, I guess I now thank you with a round of applause <laughs> for sharing this insight. And I now invite um, Professor Kirchner Emil Kirchner for uh, chairing the next panel. Uh, ah, here. Reflect a little bit more on <coughs> what the previous two books have done and look out <coughs> to the new perspective and in particularly in the Pacific, which has risen in importance as mentioned once again by the Commission Representative on Trade. It's extremely important to look at that geoeconomics, the geopolitical aspect, more so with the <clears throat> agreement between China and Russia to cooperate without limits, all that impacts on that region. So what we do in this first panel is to look a little bit more at the security implications, and in particular, I think as raised by Thomas in his <clears throat> uh, message for uh, the uh, workshop here, is where is the EU's place in this very crowded and contested uh, Indo-Pacific area. How can we find some appropriate means to interact? And so we have four speakers for this panel. <coughs> the first one is by Sven Biskop. I'm very pleased that Sven, who is <coughs> a senior researcher at Egmont Institute, was part of the um, book project, he and Mark Beeson did a chapter on the global impact of EU-Asia relations, looking particularly at geoeconomics and geopolitics. So I'm very pleased that Sven, you can be with us today. <coughs> I will then follow with a presentation, looking again <coughs> more specifically at that notion of EU's place in the Indo-Pacific, 
We then have uh, Eva Pestrova. Is Eva here? Oh, yeah, over there. Sorry, I didn't see it coming in. Who is Japan Chair at the Free University here, the Flemish one? And no doubt you will probably speak on that subject or relate it. And then finally, we have Safran Chentils, who is a PhD candidate at the Area Studies at the University of Oxford, and he will speak a little bit more on China, EU, China, but in more particularly on EU-Hong Kong relations. So that's the panel. Let's then start with Sven. I give you the word, and uh, here we are. Thank you, uh, Emil. I will st uh, speak standing up, because um, uh, I'll be sitting for the rest of the day, uh, basically. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me, first of all, to the to the book project, uh, and, and then also to the to the conference uh, to the conference here. Just a few of the cuff uh, remarks, in a way, reflecting on um, where we are on the EU's role in, in the Indo-Pacific. Maybe three preliminary remarks. Um, one just outside here, of course, is the uh, Colonne du Congrès commemorating Belgian independence and, and our, our first king, and buried below it is an unknown soldier of the Great War, where we now commemorate all the fallen of all the subsequent course, wars, including the Korean War. Um, and in fact, I think even the Belgians have forgotten that the Belgian armed forces have already fought the People's Liberation Army in Korea. Uh, it is, however, I, I don't think it's our planning to do so uh, anytime soon again if we can uh, if we can avoid it so i think a major interest of the eu is to avoid a direct great power war that of course applies also to the war taking part on our eastern border russia's war against um, against ukraine two i will confess i'm still skeptical about the notion of indo-pacific and whether it is in eu's interest to use indo-pacific as the definition um, because it's such an enormous region, does it even exist? Huh? I'm getting in trouble now because I have a PhD student who writes on the EU and the Indo-Pacific, and I'm sure she'll beat me over the head, or she would if she were in the room, but she isn't. Uh, but I'm not sure, why. maybe she's online. Um, but you know, uh, f for sure the region is so huge that EU's interest in different parts of the region are very different. If you only look, for example, at maritime security, one could very well argue that maritime security in the, um, in the western half of the Indian Ocean is not only a vital interest, but is also a core task for the EU itself. And indeed, this is where we are deployed. Operation Atalanta has been, has been there for many years. But is it also an, a core task of the EU itself to, for example, ensure maritime security in the South China Sea, or is it even in our interest? I'm not sure that the notion of the concept of Indo-Pacific is very well suited to guide the way the EU organizes its policy. And to be honest, if you read the Indo-Pacific strategy, it is basically a copy and paste of various pre-existing strategies where we've taken different elements and then put the name Indo-Pacific about on it. Why? Because everybody else was writing Indo-Pacific strategies. It seemed to be the thing to do. It seemed to be fashionable, and so apparently one could not avoid it. But I'm not sure that I've seen since we adopted this strategy any major breakthrough or acceleration of our policies. So I'm a little bit um, skeptical. It leads me to the, the third point also. Um, we should really think about um, our interests here in this very, um, in this very broad region. Um, the EU always says that we are against spheres of influence and that certainly we do not seek one. Um, but a great part of the competition going on in the Indo-Pacific is of course exactly about that, spheres of influence. Uh, it, there's a, a geopolitical competition between the United States and China. The US is the dominant power um, in the Pacific, certainly, and tries to maintain that position vis-a-vis -vis China, which is trying to break that dominance, one could say, in order to ascertain that its own um, economy and its own trade could not be interrupted by the US in case of conflict. From a strictly European point of view, this is a bilateral competition between those, do between those two. Our vital interest is not necessarily directly at stake. Whoever, I mean, whoever 
controls the South China Sea or, or not is not as in itself, I think, a major interest of the EU. The question for us is, will it affect our trade, right? Um, of course, that competition, the way it plays out, suppose, hypothetically, if it would be won by China, it will have major repercussions, could have major repercussions if it affects US policies and US standing. So we do have a stake on it, um, but at the same time, um, who or who controls or does not control which specific island in that in that region uh, is not necessarily directly uh, in our vital in our vital interest uh, in our vital interest either. And I think this calls for a subtle a subtle game on the part of the EU. I think it's important for us that we take our lead also from the states of the region. I would argue, for example, that as long as the other literal states of the South China Sea, to focus just on this example, as long as they contest China's claims, and China's claims clearly are spurious, they have absolutely no foundation in, in international law, but as long as the literal states contest them, we should support the, uh, the, the, literal, the literal states. Whether that also means that we have a military role to play in the region, I think is something else. Clearly, in term, we do not have the capabilities at this moment. You could also argue that it would be more in our interest to take the lead in ensuring security in our own periphery, thus enabling the United States to focus more of its assets on, on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo so these were three preliminary uh, remarks. That then brings me to uh, a, bigger, uh, a bigger overall point. How, in the end, then, do we deal with um, with, with geopolitical competition or with, uh, or with strategic competition. Personally, I remain convinced of our strategy uh, of regarding other powers, not just China, but other, all other powers as, at the same time, partners, um, uh, competitors and rivals. And of course, the degrees in which another state is one, is one of those three depends on the case on the case at hand. But I do think it remains important also vis-a-vis -vis China to continue to make the distinction between legitimate acts of competition and illegitimate acts of rivalry. If another state, including China, is successful by in playing the game while more or less following the rules of the game, we cannot criticize it for that. Nor are we obliged to rejoice, right? But it, you can't criticize someone for being in the game. All other states have the right to be in the game as well. If we think they're doing too well, then we must up our own game. Of course, if another state uh, is successful by, by breaking the rules or ignoring the rules, then we must have the capacity and the audacity to push back and, if necessary, even retaliate. But it is important to continue mm -hmm. to distinguish between, between the two, because if you see every legitimate act of competition as a hostile act of rivalry, then you're set on a course that can only lead to confrontation. And again, we have absolutely no interest in a direct confrontation between the great powers. We also have absolutely no interest in an escalation of that competition into permanent rivalry that would lead to an overall decoupling. Because if the world would fall apart again in two blocks, basically we and the Americans against the Russians and the Chinese, um, first of all, the economically, it would be very costly. It could be done if you wanted to, but you see how much economic chaos our partial decoupling from Russia is causing. Decoupling from China would be a lot more costly. So you probably only want to do it if there is no other option um, uh, available. Two, uh, creation of two blocks would not stop there. If you would have a new Cold War, EU, US versus Russia and China, the next thing, we know this from the Cold War, is that both blocs would try to entice or even coerce all other states on the planet to choose sides. So you would trigger an instant geopolitical rivalry between the two blocs. If you have two blocs who no longer cooperate, uh, then you can also forget about any effective climate policy. Not that climate policy is so effective now, but uh, at least we still pretend uh, that it is. So my point of view is just to say that it is absolutely not in our interest to trigger a new cold, a new cold war. It, the risk is there. It may happen, although I think it has been for now averted because of China's basically non-interventionist stance in the Russian war against against Ukraine. But the risk, but the risk remains. So if it happens, we'll have to deal with it. But we have absolutely no interest into provoking it. We have every interest as a global trade power in maintaining 
global free trade or in maintaining globalization rather. And, and this uh, requires us, uh, I would say, to adhere to four points of action. So I'll quickly mention those four and that'll be my conclusion. One, I fear we have no option but to compartmentalize between the domestic policies of other states and their foreign policies. Domestic policies of other states may be utterly reprehensible. And then I think we must be uh, willing to criticize them whenever and wherever we see violations of uh, universal human rights. Of course, also by China, which happen on a da daily basis. However, in many cases, there is little we can do about it. So uh, we must also accept the limits to our leverage. You know, whatever we do or don't do, um, China will not change its uh, horrible policy towards the Uyghurs, for example. China will not change its Hong Kong policy. So you must criticize it, but you must also know there's no point in adopting sanction after sanction because it will have zero effect and you will have wasted your instrument. So I would say criticize the domestic policies that do violate universal values, but keep your powder dry and reserve effective instruments to push back and retaliate when other states cross our lines in their foreign policy when it may directly affect our interests. Uh, that is not a very satisfactory, that's very pragmatic or a very realpolitik approach, but I fear it's the only, only realistic approach. To continue with open uh, strategic autonomy, uh, we have every interest in maintaining an, an open economy, but of course you can only do that if you build in um, protective measures, not protectionist, but protective. You need to know which part of your economy you, you, can, you consider so critical to our economic sovereignty and therefore to our political sovereignty that you want to keep full control and so you don't sell it to non-EU actors. Uh, you want to know which part of the economy you want consider so important that you want your own production capacity and if necessary you invest or you subsidize recreating it where you have abandoned it which we have done in many cases, but voluntarily, of course. And, and three, that's the most difficult part. We must find ways to push other states to open their economy to us uh, to the same extent as we open to them. We must push for reciprocity, specifically from China. Sadly, I have no answer on how to do that, but I think it is vital. So open strategic autonomy. Third strand of action, the global gateway. Um, I think the global gateway is, is the good strategy. It's our own investment package. It allows us to go around the world and, and say, look, we don't expect you to kick out China. We're not going to kick out China anytime soon. But we do suggest you to be smart and diversify. Don't put all your eggs in a Chinese basket. Here's an EU basket as well. But the, the basket then must contain something. Uh, we announced the global gateway in the State of the Union last year. It was announced again in the State of the Union this year, this year, which probably means that not that much has happened if you have to announce its launch twice. We must now really do it. We cannot overload it with political conditionalities. If you say, here's the global gateway, but to join, you must be as democratic as Switzerland, then sadly, it's not, it's not going to fly, uh, but we must, uh, we must uh, do it, the global, the global gateway. And final point, multilateral institutions. Let's not forget about multilateralism. In the end, if you look at the strategies of the other global players, we are the only one as EU that is principally committed to multilateralism. Even if you read the uh, national security strategy of the Biden administration, which just came out a few, a few weeks ago, there is very little in there about institutionalized <coughs> multilateralism. What, what, the, what the strategy understands under the heading of multilateralism is rather the United States' own initiative towards other group of countries. Uh, the, the, what is it, the, the, the Partnership for Global Investment and Infrastructure, the outreach to Africa. But if we focus only on that kind of multilateralism, the Chinese on Belt and Road, we on the Global Gateway, the US on PGII, then we are in a way all trying to build our spheres of influence. We don't need that. We need an open war policy. We need all those countries to treat all commerce equally. And we must continue to invest in the universal multilateral institutions where in the end all of the global players are playing a leading role and have to play a leading role. So I think for me here really also is a core task of the EU um, to, to make sure that we keep investing, uh, including our allies, the United States, in the universal multilateral uh, institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Sven, for starting off, which is appropriate, 
some critical remarks about really what Indo-Pacific means. Much appreciated. And your four points <coughs> generally are indeed opening up the topic more. I will try to pick up to some extent on those points, perhaps fleshing out a little bit more as to what the implications could be. My starting point <coughs> is indeed going back to where is the EU's place potentially in that particular region. It's a very crowded place, it's a contested place, as we already have alluded. <coughs> I think we have to start with the uh, EU's Indo-Pacific strategy. <coughs> I know, Sven, you're right. It is somewhat ambiguous. It doesn't really specify what all the implications could mean. But as a starting point, I think it is probably all right. But the point I try to make is it needs to be indeed implemented. It cannot just be rhetorically stated. And if it is implemented, uh, implemented to some extent su sufficiently and combined or complemented with other economic and connectivity partnerships, then I think we have a chance probably to see some uh, impact and some progress. You recall once again, the strategy of course talks about an open and rule-based regional security architecture, including secure sea lines and communications, capacity building, and enhanced naval presence in that particular region. <coughs> so it does uh, in accordance with UNCLOS, and it also tries to sort of support the <coughs> free and open in the Pacific, which is a concept promoted by Japan and the United States. Um, I see we have no slides, so I operating on my own. Um, I think we could move on to the right. <coughs> so it's indeed here where we already start to see some problems on you know, the naval operations. To what extent can we indeed rely on that? France and the UK have a naval presence in the Asia Pacific and <coughs> have both the two plus military cooperation with Japan. But when you look at other countries, Germany or the Netherlands, can they master the required naval capacity or willingness to conduct a sufficient number of joint naval exercises and port calls in that <coughs> region? and to make a tangible contribution to the freedom of navigation in that region. Germany's effort sending a frigate to the South China Sea in 2021 was not a successful undertaking and that is indeed sort of quite a negative uh, <coughs> memory. Moving on please to the next slide. So making up for potential shortcomings in that naval presence, I think the EU should encourage greater participation in, of Indo-Pacific partners to allow them to come into the CSTV missions and operations. I think this is a crucial factor. If we want to make those missions more successful, we need greater participation. The uh, Martin Pratt, referred briefly this morning about framework arrangements. I think we need to flesh them out much more and allow those participant countries to come in. And the same is to flesh out much more. ASEAN was raised this morning. We need to gain access to the East Summit or the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. Next slide, please. We need clearly trade diversification and economic partnerships. And again, this was raised this morning by the Commission representative. I think we need to establish much more resilient and sustainable uh, arrangements uh, and to make sure that our value chains are diversified and that we're not becoming too dependent. And that our technological standards have been and regulations have been more widespread and embedded in that particular region. Those are our value principles and we must observe them. 
So I think we need to build on what we have successfully established in our economic partnership with Japan and South Korea, and therefore continue similar negotiations with Australia, Indonesia, and New Zealand. It was mentioned by the representative of the Commission this morning. There is uneven progress, and I think it really needs to be upgraded. Not mentioned by her this morning was East Africa, the East African community, I think deserves equally attention and some negotiations there. Whether we <laughs> can indeed proceed with ASEAN in the regionally or not is again an open question still. Let's move on, please, the next slide. Connectivity, I think the 28 EU uh, connectivity to Asia is an important one. And I think it should be complemented through the arrangement of the Green Alliance partnerships and digital partnerships with willing and ambitious Indo-Pacific partners. Throughout the efforts which Sven already mentioned, the Global Gateway, I think it's very important, and the Horizon Program, which hasn't mentioned so far. I think it is important that we include partners from that region into the Horizon Program. So already we have connectivity partnerships with Japan and uh, <coughs> are opening up one with India. There's the possibility that we have some arrangement already with ASEAN on that. <coughs> There's also the possibility that we could link with the U.S. partnership, global, uh, the partnership global for infrastructure investment. <coughs> if we do all that, I think there would be a much greater possibility to stand up to <coughs> the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and growing Chinese assertiveness in the regional and the global level, <coughs> particularly when it comes to cybersecurity or cyber, cyber sovereignty and digital nationalism. Next slide, please. A few comments on the United States. Sven again mentioned that, at least indirectly. I think while both the EU and the US share interests in pursuance of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region, they also differ in their approach to the region, or more specifically, in their dealing with China. Hence, their sharing and competing aspects between the two partners. Next slide. Parallel to providing extensive military, financial, and other assistance to the Ukraine, the US has called on Europe to step up its efforts for its own regional security. Nothing new there. Trump did that, of course, before. Doing so would, on the one hand, require strenuous efforts to overcome a fragmented European defense industry, which is lamentable in its own rights. One can speak quite lengthy on that. But on the other, offer prospects for the European Defense Union and or greater strategic autonomy, again, which Sven mentioned. These proposals could rise with prevailing uncertainties about the Trump comeback in 2024, as we all have noticed recently, his announcement. However, greater defense spending in Europe could also affect the allocation of similar European resources in the Indo-Pacific region. We should not forget that transfer potential spillback. Next slide. So, <clears throat> EU is trade, technological contestation and competition. Again, we should not neglect mentioning that because it is a factor in our EU effort to find our place in the Indo-Pacific region. Recent US actions to reduce imports from China and elsewhere in the high-tech sector and produce more of its own, both by American firms and by foreign ones, is linked with US pressures on the EU to lower its business with China. Given that China is the biggest EU trade partner in goods, 
the EU is unlikely to concede to these demands, at least not to a substantial extent. This could lead to EU-US frictions. Also, as the US is insisting on a more home protection in this sector, it could impede EU exports to the United States. Now, of course, concerns of economic dependence are not only a US concern, but also a European one. And um, we learned about this particularly in the corona pandemic when we had problems in the supply of medical equipment and there is a growing awareness in Europe that high dependency on certain Chinese imports, such as semiconductors, solar panels, and raw earths, is unsustainable. As, depend as dependency on these products is now already higher than the gas dependency the EU had with Russia. Quite enormous. Next slide, please. However, while we need to move towards qualifying one-sided dependencies, we must not abandon openness altogether. Rather, the aim is to maintain a good balance between viewing China as a partner, competitor, and rival, as spelled out in the EU paper of 2019 on China. Still, any lingering hope of change through trade, the famous German approach in, in that, has died with President Xi's authoritarian turn. I agree with Sven, however, we cannot compromise on the universality of human rights and must maintain that to a large extent. So the EU internal reactions should not be neglected either. I think what the EU has done with its more recent CHIPS Act proposal to achieve a share of global production capacity of 20% by 2030 is among, is a, is a, it's, it's a, a noble attempt to really cope with diversification and improve domestic production and stockpiling. The EU has also introduced investment screening and regulation and foreign subsidies distorting the internal market, but importantly, this is unevenly applied by member states. I'm happy to elaborate on this aspect in the Q&A. So let me conclude. The EU is clearly aware that the evolving strategy dynamics in the Indo-Pacific are of paramount importance for the future of the rule-based international order and is, is stepping up its role by leveraging a strong economic profile, long-standing bilateral ties and active engagement in various regional multilateral forums. However, whether it and its member states can make uh, a sufficient uh, resource and commitment to that um, uh, undertaking is yet an open question, and therefore time only will tell. Thank you very much for your attention. We will now follow with Eva Pesachova. Yep. Will you do it from over there? Of course. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Professor Kirchner, and of course, thanks to, to SEPS for inviting me uh, and for giving us such a broad topic. Uh, I have to say that uh, when I was asking the organizers beforehand what is the kind of foreseen idea, they said, feel free to share whatever um, recent research you've been currently working on, whatever thoughts. So apologies in advance if I abused of this freedom because um, I'm fully aware that uh, when you talk about strategic contestations and security in the Indo-Pacific, one expects hearing something about the Straits of Taiwan, uh, about the East China Sea, about the South China Sea, and about all the things that uh, a lot of us actually that tour these conferences hear about. Um, and as much as these uh, considerations are of course extremely important, and I'm sure you've addressed them in the report, uh, I have uh, chosen to actually zoom out a little bit and uh, look at what could be, in my view, 
the next frontiers of strategic competition uh, in the region for several reasons. Uh, because they are uh, not only, and when I say next frontiers, I'm alluding to something that is referred to as the global commons. Not necessarily strictly defined as the global commons, but basically related to the critical infrastructures. I'm talking about the deep sea governance, I'm talking about the outer space and about the information space. Why? Because they are monumentally important for absolutely everything uh, we do, that Europe does, that we do with our partners, that uh, the, the world economy depends on. Because they are issues that cut across actually security, trade and connectivity, which are uh, the topic of this seminar, so I thought it was fitting well, uh, whether we talk about data flows that Maria Martin Prat was referring to or digital partnerships, these data actually flow through somewhere and this is what we are actually talking about in a more kind of weaponized, uh, weaponized way. Uh, because also it is frankly one area where I think that the EU can contribute most. And whether we like it or not, uh, we may speculate about the EU's potential security role and non-traditional security and governance co you know, contribution in the region. But one role that really the EU has uh, and the biggest leverage is its trading power and its regulatory power. Uh, the EU is often referred to as the incubator for multilateral regulatory regimes, uh, which is the case. We have seen it on data protection, but we can also see it in other areas. Finally, of course, it's also an area that as a global common, automatically it, sh it should steer cooperation. And, and I understood that that was also one of the reasons, uh, one of the rationales behind your, your project. Um, what we see in terms of a sort of a big picture or macro trend in the region, uh, and it's been alluded to here, uh, is a new form, in my view, of strategic competition. And I don't want to be scaring uh, all of you. I think it's very obvious. Uh, it has been driven at the beginning by the US-China competition, but the current Russia-China rapprochement really shows uh, a phenomenon that goes way beyond the region, that is very much global. Uh, and in that case, we do not need to basically quote the Indo-Pacific being the Indo-Pacific or anything. It is. It started a debate that has become much more ide ideological, actually, uh, in its sense. Um, and it is not just China or Russia, um, but when we look at what's going on within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and I know it does not attract a lot of attention, but there has been significant uh, um, exchanges, coordination at the, for, for in multilateral levels, etc., uh, that with now India and Pakistan really gathers half of the global population. If we add the BRICS, if we add China's connection through the Belt and Road Initiative, we are really <laughs> coming up to uh, uh, the kind of constatation that we're not dealing with a single man out. It's not just China or Russia being a disturber of a so-called rules-based order. We are dealing with half or even more than half of the world's population, right? So this is just to kind of put things into, into perspective. So when we talk about some sort of Cold War polarization, whether we're there or not, or heading there or not is another issue, is just that rules-based is also about numbers. And when it comes to global commons, it is not to kind of, you know, fall into the trap of, uh, of the kind of democracies versus authoritarian regimes binary, but we're talking about mostly the openness versus enclosure uh, approaches, whether it's uh, maritime, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's all sorts of governance of those uh, of those um, manners and what i find uh quite dangerous that instead of and we're talking about competition here instead of growing competition between these two concepts not talking about blocks the risk is that we will see an emergence of a parallel uh kind of global order if you want it's that only about whose norms will matter or whose world order will prevail is that we may end up with countries having the choice to join one or the other. And therefore, we may end up in the same kind of Cold War um, uh, legacy that, uh, that, that Sven was referring to, which will also inhibit or prohibit any progress on, on, on climate change, global issues, etc. To give you just a few examples on deep sea, I'm not speaking for too long. Um, 
we have talked about critical undersea infrastructure. We know that it carries 90% of uh, the global economy, of all the world's data. 90% is, of course, uh, a lot. We know, we have seen the criticism now of Russia uh, eventually having the capacities to undermine it, etc. So the, you know, the need to include basically deep sea strategies within any maritime power expansion or the possibility to defend or protect our maritime infrastructure is now part of uh, many countries' approaches, including France, of course, China, and uh, the EU uh, has been working on one as well. Deep sea mining is a new frontier of strategic competition. Uh, we will be talking about the access to strategic resources uh, when we talk about green transition, the access to uh, the polymetallic nodules which contain metals, precious ores that are needed for the production of batteries and solar panels and uh, are to a large extent also located in the deep seas. And we are talking about an area that is not, that is laying beyond uh, national jurisdiction. So legally, it is the common heritage of mankind under ANCOS, it is ungoverned. I'm talking why these, all these future areas will be important in the future. I won't go into details what China does, um, but I'm doing a little bit of research there. It's, it's extremely fascinating and I'm happy to comment on it later. Same for cyber domain. Uh, I seem to understand that the United Nations group on, uh, of experts uh, on um, uh, advancing responsible state behavior in, spine, uh, in cyberspace has been pretty much in a deadlock. I do understand that there is not much progress that uh, is going to be achieved, and this is one of the reflections that made me think of the parallel world orders, because it was China, Russia, and the SCO members who actually came up with the first proposal in 2011. 20 years later, we are in a deadlock with basically two blocks not agreeing of what sort of international norms we will be adopting, hence the potential of uh, basically ending up with two. Another example, space governance, uh, greatly underestimated, again, uh, is the advanced state of cooperation between Russia and China. Um, there's a recent agreement on, um, on integrating the Beidou and the GLONASS, global navigation satellite systems, which will be in direct competition with the GPS, with the Galileo. Uh, but of course, I mean, b besides of the, of the kind of a commercial and economic impacts, uh, there are strategic implications. Uh, whether we talk about a potential conflict uh, over Taiwan uh, or, or others in the region, most of the modern weapons uh, system are actually using satellite imagery and systems to navigate and to be localized as well, right? So this is a, is a concrete strategic um, uh, weapon. And of course, China and both China and Russia are ha having their own networks of countries where they station the different monitoring uh, stations. Now, if and as they do cooperate together and integrate those systems, actually we are facing with a very, very solid um, adversary. Other issues, Arctic, Antarctic, I mean, name it, uh, the, the, the level of diplomatic and scientific cooperation between uh, Russia and China and the network that I was referring to is actually much more advanced than we thought. It is not dating from February 2022, it is predating. Uh, we see it a lot in the Arctic, um, and we see China's efforts to kind of what we call it, the scientific diplomacy, right? To, 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 to work on an issue, to have the resources to work on an issue, to the point when it becomes a member of the Antarctic Council or the Arctic Council and eventually be able to mend the rules from within. Uh, and often in so many situations, Europeans have actually come to kind of a fait accompli why I'm talking about these issues is precisely that we should act now in order to not sleepwalk into more disasters in the future. As we know, on the European level, there has been quite a lot of developed um, regulations for all these, all these matters, frankly, including on deep sea protection, including on the recent um, regulation on critical infrastructure. Uh, there was a commission proposal uh, on critical uh, infrastructure resilience, which focuses on preparedness, response, and international cooperation, be it in energy, digital, transport, and space. So it basically covers all these. Um, it's frankly quite detailed with a five-point action plan, preparedness, a lot of things that can be done uh, among the member states level in uh, coordination in responding, early warning, etc. 
there is a, an emphasis to cooperate with NATO, but also with other partners. And this is, I think, where I would pretty much conclude uh, that our like-minded partners in, in the region are really, uh, it, it could be a real topic for discussion with Japan, Korea, Australia. Uh, you name it, uh, as we are all you know, looking for concrete um, kind of substance, uh, it is something where we eat, need to uh, act now, uh, be proactive and inject a little bit of this logic, whether it's in global gateway or digital partnerships or bilateral partnerships. I will end there. Hello? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, so, yeah, China and then Hong Kong in, uh, in particular. My name is Serafin, PhD candidate at Oxford, and um, talking about this very tiny, geographically tiny, but very important territory in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the city of Hong Kong. And I'll specifically focus on the relationship between Hong Kong and the EU in light of what the city has gone through in the past uh, few years. Um, as you know, in many respects, Hong Kong uh, today isn't the city it used to be, uh, because in June 2020, you have a, a little timeline there. Uh, mainland Chinese in, uh, authorities imposed a national security law on the city, which changed the political and societal landscape in Hong Kong completely. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, by its own standards, the EU responded quite swiftly. Um, three weeks later, uh, after the implementation of the, the law, uh, the Council proposed conclusions, which you can see here on the screen, in which it called for action in response to the, the national security law. Uh, for example, it calls upon member states to uh, review their extradition agreements with Hong Kong, uh, to look at their export of dual-use goods, uh, crowd control uh, equipment and so on to Hong Kong, and to observe the trials of pro-democracy uh, activists in, in Hong Kong, etc. There are more measures than what you can see on the screen here. Uh, but importantly, member states are essentially free to choose which, if indeed any, of the measures uh, they implement, and their implementation varies from member states to to member states. So, for example, did all member states follow the Council's calls uh, and suspend their extradition agreements with Hong Kong? Uh, I don't think so. France did, Germany did very quickly, uh, a number of others did, but, uh, but not everyone. Um, next uh, slide, please. Do all member states, that previous slide please, that's a bit too quick, there we go. Uh, do all member state diplomats on the ground in Hong Kong enthusiastically participate in the observation of uh, pro-democracy activists as, as asked for by the council? Uh, not at all. From interviews, I, I know that that's uh, not the case. And so we're faced with two observations uh, on Hong Kong. One is that the EU's many uh, public statements of concern uh, and its council conclusions uh, are there. They, they are calling for action in response to the situation in Hong Kong. And two, the varied uh, implementation of these uh, conclusions by member states is what we actually see uh, on the ground. And, and to understand why that is, we must consider the heart and soul of the EU-Hong Kong relationship, and that is trade and investment, simply speaking. Um, in my view today, after all that's happened, that is still uh, the aspect of state that takes precedence over uh, all the other concerns over what the city has gone through. Um, I asked a senior EU, EU diplomat once why the EU has a diplomatic presence in the city, and he said, well, we're here for three reasons. That's business, business, and, and business. And so if the focus of this workshop is on security, trade, and connectivity, it seems to me that Hong Kong fits right into that nexus, uh, because there is the real possibility that Hong Kong, uh, the state of Hong Kong as a globally um, important financial center is threatened. Um, and that would have very serious ramifications, I think, as Professor Biscop alluded to, for the EU trade uh, relationship with, with China and the, and the wider region. But we're not there yet because despite the upheaval that the city has gone through, uh, Hong Kong continues to be uh, an absolutely vital uh, kingpin in the re relationship, uh, the trading relationship between the EU and uh, China. Next slide, please. As you can see, it's still the third largest uh, investment hub uh, globally, um, after, I think, New York and London. 
It has free capital mo movement as opposed to mainland China. It's uh, an enormous facilitator of the mainland's access to foreign capital, and its economy is disproportionately useful to, uh, to China. Between 2010 and 2018, 73% of that, that's three quarters of all mainland uh, Chinese companies' IPOs overseas. I must add, it's overseas, it's missing on the slide, but uh, so three quarters of, the, of uh, those uh, IPOs overseas were listed in Hong Kong. 64% of foreign direct investment uh, going into mainland China was channeled through Hong Kong. These are enormous numbers, and 65% and of Chinese outward investment uh, as well. And so other people uh, have pointed out a paradox, namely that the more autocratic the mainland becomes, the more it needs Hong Kong uh, commercially, because that is the place within China where business can still flow uh, relatively freely. And that is also why I think mainland Chinese authorities took uh, such a big risk by imposing the national security law in 2020, because that law could have meant uh, uh, and does mean a, a massive deterioration of trust in Hong Kong, and, uh, and it could uh, provoke an exodus of foreign and financial, foreign financial and human uh, capital. Next slide, please. Um, and so let me just be clear: there is uh, a de deterioration of trust. There is an outflow of foreign financial and uh, and human capital. And I haven't even mentioned the, the tens of thousands of Hong Kongers who have left uh, the city to go and settle in the UK, in the US, in Canada, or elsewhere. You see them on the streets in in the UK. I mean, there are visibly more. Hong Kong people walking around that they're just settling in their thousands, you know, uh, everywhere that you can find a, a welcome home, uh, basically. Uh, next slide, please. And I certainly don't want to paint a rosy picture here about the status that Hong Kong finds itself here. If companies are leaving, uh, there is a lack of trust now in the city, foreign staff are leaving. But speaking to businesses and chambers of commerce on the ground, uh, one gets the impression that they're leaving more because of strict COVID rules. Uh, than actually because of the national security law, although, of course, companies don't want to mention that the law might be their reason for their uh, departure. COVID offers a useful excuse. So to sum up, we have a, a long period post handover uh, where relations between the EU and Hong Kong are good, trade is good, investment good, uh, everybody's happy. And then comes 2020, and this changes uh, completely. The EU then acts quite quickly and robustly, uh, but the implementation of proposed measures uh, among member states is far from universal. And so, uh, next slide, please. The uh, EU has ticked most of the boxes it could have ticked. Uh, it has voiced concerns publicly and privately. It has proposed concrete measures in response, but it hasn't really acted in, in other ways. The question then is, what, what else can the EU do? Uh, what other measures would carry the agreement of all EU 27? There are no sanctions against Hong Kong officials. There are plenty of sanctions against people who are involved in, in Xinjiang, for example, people who are involved in the, in the war in Russia, but nothing against any Hong Kong officials. There's no measures that impact trade uh, and investment directly. Um, and you see what I'm driving at. The, the, the role that Hong Kong plays as a bridge into the Chinese market uh, is at this moment uh, still too important for the EU to contemplate drastically rethinking the relationship. Um, next slide, please. One observation I can make about the added value of the, the EU's diplomatic presence on the ground in Hong Kong is that at the time of the implementation of the, the national security law, the external action service people in Hong Kong really did make a difference in terms of providing a combined response. Uh, more than a few diplomats that I've spoken to have pointed out the excellent leadership of the head of office uh, of the EU office there in Hong Kong, who was uh, instrumental in getting member states together um, and, and making joint representations to the Hong Kong government. Uh, would this have been different? I think that Professor Biscop also spoke about uh, Brexit. Would this have been different about uh, if in case the UK has still been a member state? Would Britain at the time of the implementation of the national security law have played more of a leadership role uh, as a sort of first among equals in Hong Kong at least? Uh, it's difficult to say, but what, what is striking is that the EU office really showed its usefulness um, in being, first of all, on the ground, an intelligence provider for those member states who simply don't have the capacity, the diplomats on the ground to, to, to in detail, assess what is actually going on. And secondly, to make sure that a combined EU response and a voice was heard in local Hong Kong government circles. Um, next slide, please. So I think that is where the EU can continue to add uh, value. It, it cannot change the facts on the ground. Again, as Professor Biscop said, there's, there's little we can do. Uh, Hong Kong isn't going to change because the EU uh, politely asks for it. Uh, but in the current climate, it can provide a combined weight for member states. It can be a neutral broker. It can continue to push for good access to local government. And it can make sure that the EU businesses can continue to rely on Hong Kong as a bridge into, into China. Uh, but 
importantly, that doesn't mean it should keep quiet about the other part of the relationship. While, while being the moderate neutral combined force for good uh, in the world of business, the EU should keep on using its combined cloud to push for positive change in Hong Kong itself, to engage with civil, civil society in the city, and above all, to keep the spotlight firmly on this very visible marker of supremely confident Chinese behavior. Um, I think that's putting it mildly. Um, I will end by, by summarizing quickly. For the time being, Hong Kong is irreplaceable, in my view, in terms of access to liquidity and as a springboard into China. That, and again, that is probably about to change, but I think it's, it's still a bit too early to, to say that for certain. But in the current environment, the EU should, I think, do two things which are realistic uh, goals. One, it should honor its reputation as being a normative power and, and use its combined weight to uh, tell the Chinese and Hong Kong governments that it uh, fundamentally disagrees with their approach. And, and two, it should remain a broker working on behalf of its member states. It should provide an umbrella to shield EU businesses who risk being caught up in the negative uh, consequences of more radical US behavior in the region. And I believe that's where the EU can make a difference uh, for its member states by, uh, I'll steal a phrase from Julio's recent article, by working to achieve mercantile goals uh, in Hong Kong as elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Savitin, for highlighting Hong Kong's place in EU-China relations, an aspect which is not often given importance, though, as you, ha as you have mentioned, it is a very important uh, investment uh, criteria, and therefore we should not neglect that. We now have um, at least a good 15 minutes left for our discussion, so I would invite people to raise their hands, please, if they have questions for the speakers. Thanks very much. Um, amazing presentations, thank you. Uh, and very interesting. Cameron Cowan, I'm with the New Zealand Mission to the EU and NATO here in Brussels. Um, I, it's hard to sort of sum this up into one question and who to direct it to, but I think a lot of really important points were raised. One aspect that I'm really interested in, and it links back to the concept of the Indo-Pacific and is it useful, um, and also links into some of the issues around global commons and the new inter and what they mean in the modern context. Um, and also linking traditional security with trade. And I guess it means, the, my question is, the southern Pacific part of the Indo-Pacific and the EU's interests there, because from New Zealand perspective, we look up into the Indo-Pacific from the South Pacific uh, upwards. Um, and we see... I guess I would say a lot of the interests that have been talked about relate to the northern Indo part of the equation, and yet we're seeing a lot of geostrategic competition taking place in the south and the Pacific. And so I guess my question relates to, have we, in terms of how the EU engages, often, I guess, led through the, an economic uh, viewpoint, through FTAs and so on, uh, into the south, and the other part of it would be in the Pacific, you see engagement largely through development cooperation. That, that is the face of the EU and Europe for a lot of Pacific nations. Now, my question, I guess, is what does the EU need to do in terms of its approach, if anything, to engage effectively in the Pacific? If you look at its footprint there, the, the mission in Suva, for example, has 70 staff, four of them are policy staff, the rest are doing development projects. Is this the right approach to engage on the issues you're talking about and to achieve the EU's interests, and how could that be changed? Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Yang Li from Institute for China Europe Studies. And I have uh, two questions, one for Sven and one for uh, Persova. Uh, and the question for Sven is that uh, the, um, you mentioned the uh, uh, 
legitimate competition versus uh, hostile rivalry. So could you elaborate on that? Uh, so what is the borderline between these two concepts? So, and my question for Peshaw is that uh, you mentioned uh, deep sea mining and the uh, strategic competition regarding that. And you said that this area is uh, relatively unregulated. Uh, but uh, we understand that there's kind of international seabed authority established by the UNCLOS, which is supposed to govern the deep sea by mining in a multilateral framework. So how do you uh, define the role of uh, international seabed authority? And under that framework, so there's any room for China and Europe to coordinate or cooperate? Thank you. Hi, um, this is Amaya Sanchez from the EUIWS in Paris. I have a question for Eva as well. It's linked to the, you mentioned there is regulation in high level for all these um, sort of critical technologies. And I was wondering whether this could be integrated into the G7, PGII, P3W perhaps, and the Blue Dot Network. That's my question. Okay, I think uh, <coughs> the questions were raised particularly for Sven and uh, Eva, so why don't we start perhaps in the reverse order. Eva, you can start. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the question. I'll start from uh, the first one. Uh, Southern Pacific, I would, uh, if, I, if I repeat uh, perhaps my, my colleague's uh, kind of approach, uh, there would be three main drivers for the Europeans to be interested in Southern Pacific, and it would be France, France, and France. Um, France is indeed the country uh, that is physically present uh, in the in Southern Pacific. It has territories, it's, it's, it's part of its national um sovereignty. Uh, it has significant interests, uh, not only in the Southern Pacific, but also in the, in the Southern Indian Ocean. Uh, on the Indian Ocean side, it is part of uh, EORA. It is, an, it is part of the Indian Ocean Commission. It, it, it's basically an integral part of some of the multilateral structures. When it comes to Southern Pacific, um, it is France who drove the EU's interest towards the Asian. And frankly, it is only becoming uh, much more tangible recently, but you are right, it is almost exclusively viewed or traditionally has been viewed in, in, in development terms. Uh, there has been a lot of development and environmental. Uh, so a lot of the emphasis has been on fisheries, uh, more recently uh, kind of coral protection initiatives, uh, really, really seeing it more as a, as a kind of a donor um, recipient uh, relationship. Now I understand that over the last maybe five, even more years, this is something that uh, Europeans realize needs to change. Perhaps it's a little bit too late. I understand it is something that uh, whether is or will be developed more uh, in cooperation with New Zealand and Australia, uh, which are really the two go-to partners uh, for the region. Um, I think it would be a very good idea to push uh, some of these dialogues also uh, with Taiwan, with, uh, with the US and other of the regional players. Frankly, it's, it's completely underlooked. And so far, most issues covered are really related to environmental resource management, um, uh, some of migration discussions have been related to climate change, uh, etc. But it's really more really uh, kind of based on this development nexus. There is definitely more attention um, ever since um, we we observe kind of Chinese interest in the region, and which will bring me to the deep sea mining question as well. Uh, when we saw the shifts on the Solomon Islands or the different uh, South Pacific countries uh, and, and in reaction to the reach out to China and the whole China-Taiwan dynamic in, in, in the region has been very much noticed and suddenly, of course, driven by France, but also Europeans follow. So I hope, I really hope that there will much be much more scope uh, and much more interest in, in, in the region on the European side, but it's really emerging. Which brings me to the deep sea mining question, because yes, the International Seabed Authority has had 
authority over seabed mining. But you know, it's 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 rather contested um, topic on itself. I always call it the, the Pandora's box. Basically, ever since that we have uh, signed UNCLOS, seabed mining or activities, economic uh, activities and commercial exploitations of the resources in the sea deep seabed. Uh, has been actually one of the reasons why the United States never signed the convention. Let's be, let's face it. I mean, it's 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 a very very important issue. Um, uh, there, Nauru, uh, one of the South uh, Pacific uh, island state uh, island nations, has uh, triggered the um, ultimatum in January 2022, a two years ultimatum for the ICA to ease the regulation on licenses for seabed mining. Nauru is located in the biggest area, uh, it's the Clipperton zone, um, which basically covers a large uh, chunk between Mexico and all the way to kind of New Zealand, well, half Southern Pacific, uh, which is supposed to be one of the richest uh, in polymetallic nodules. Um, and so Nauru, of course, wants to exploit. China, uh, just by interest, is one of the 10, 11 countries that is also extremely active in uh, in scientific research, but also in in technology research. Because let's let's uh, you know imagine it's an activity that is extremely demanding financially, resource-wise, technologically, uh, and there's not too many countries that actually have the capacity. So obviously, China is one of them. China currently has five or of the 30, roughly 31 licenses that has been granted by the ISA. But in its legislation from 2016, if I'm uh, correct, on seabed uh, management, it uh, also uh, urges, or one of the goals is also to press basically uh, for the reform of ISA. So just based on the case of Nauru, if I understood it correctly, uh, the United Nations, well, ISA is part of, has two years uh, from January, so one and over more, uh, one more year left to basically uh, reconsider um, this license. I, and if not, basically I understood that now we'll proceed with the exploitation regardless, right? So of course, uh, I mean, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the subject because it's, it's very, um, it's very topical. Uh, if now it starts, there will be other countries um, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but also uh, European and, and American countries. Canada is very interested. New Zealand is very interested, etc. So um, yes, we are definitely um, entering a new sphere of strategic competition, and I'm quite sure about it. <laughs> that will uh, that is the race into the abyss, not just for the resources, but also for the cables. And yes, G7. Uh, final question is: uh, I think it would be yes, we should. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent we can, uh, you know, press uh, the, our, our European colleagues to voice it up or include it on the agenda is another matter. But I think it would be a good idea to include it, of course. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks. Thank you, Emil. I'll, I'll pick up two questions. A colleague from New Zealand, I guess in a way, this, in my view, it strengthens my argument that the term Indo-Pacific is too big because it, it then hides too, too many sub-regions in it, and it's very easy to forget some of the sub-regions, right? Just like usually when the EU says um, Asia, everybody thinks China. Um, I think that's one example of it. Um, my personal feeling, but it's hard to say, more of a feeling and an academic pronouncement is that we, we should begin to shift from development to investment if we want to be an effective um, player but I do understand that even about the Global Gateway, there's a lot of debate about whether it is seen as a development policy or not. My view is we, if we put it among the other development policies, it will, it will fail. So we really need to, to, to shift gear, in my view. The other question about the borderline between competition and rivalry, obviously there is a gray zone, so I'm not pretending that this is very, very easy. But, but clearly there's already a distinction. You know, states can... Um, entice others or they can coerce them, right? BRI, for example, as such, is not an illegitimate policy initiative. It would be if China would force states to join in, or if you join in, if China would begin to force you uh, to cut off your relations with other states, for example, because then it, then it moves from enticement to, to, to coercion. 
um, there are legal ways and illegal ways of gaining influence, right? I mean, um, if I have, uh, I had lunch uh, with a Chinese official, uh, that's not illegal or it's not uh, illegitimate. There are illegal ways, of course, if, if a Chinese official will offer me money, uh, then, then it become uh, illegal. Of course, legal ways or and, and, and legitimate ways must therefore not be welcome, right? So I'm not saying that because it's legal and or legitimate, you must accept it. That's, that's not my, my point. But the way of dealing with it is, is different, right? Um, if we think that it or is not a good idea to, to sell 24.9% uh, of the port of Hamburg uh, to Costco, right? Because it's not illegal. But we don't think it's, uh, if you think it's not a good idea, you, well, you can make it illegal, for example. You can create legal conditions, right? But you cannot just say, yeah, you can't criticize China for this. They're just doing what, what, what I would do probably in their place, but you can criticize ourselves for allowing it. So I think it's the way you react to it that, that differs depending on whether the, the action against us is legal and legitimate or illegal and, and illegitimate. Thank you. Thank you, Zayn. Let me just uh, perhaps add a point about the southern Pacific, uh, Pacific the, the islands. I think what we have seen, and that goes in line with uh, Sven, what you say, we need to move from development to investment. The promise we have made now at the COP to sort of give more money to the, the islands, particularly those who are really in danger with flooding and, and so on, I think could be an attempt in the right direction. I think we need indeed to provide more money. I remember Indonesia saying, if we were able to provide some sort of uh, capital for Indonesia, it could provide much quicker results on the carbon situation by 2050. So I think uh, investments from the EU's point of view indeed is a crucial point. Uh, we're nearly at um, the time where we should stop, but if there is yet one more permanent burning <laughs> question, so please let us know. If not, yeah, there are two of them now. Kind of running close. It depends how long, and it depends yeah, exactly, how long. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, you or you decide. No, no. Please, please raise the question. And then, uh, okay. Yeah. I repeatedly hear the word partnership, then competition and rivalry. Uh, I think we are not aware that in Japanese and even Chinese, the word competition and rivalry almost is the same. They don't have this distinction. I think it's a little bit hair-splitting what we do. If you write it in Chinese characters, the word competition, I studied competition law in Japan by chance, is more or less rivalry and competition together. They don't have in their two characters really a uh, distinction to be made between rivalry and competition. I think it's very much our Western understanding, very analytic, but we don't see the overall context here. And I wonder if we should use these words in this context. Thank you. I think, Mr. Papi, that's very good. It's a, an illustration. We don't really need to elaborate that's a great deal on that. That's, that's fine. Please, um, finally. Uh, Miguel Diaz, I'm retired. I, uh, I'm, I was taken back by the continu continuing role that Hong Kong plays in terms of investment in, in China. And uh, despite the clamping down of democratic rights in that country, uh, in, in Hong Kong, I'm, I'm wondering if we ever get to the point that we want to sanction uh, monies going into Japan, uh, into China, what could actually be done on the part of the European Union, Washington, elsewhere, to undermine the role of Hong Kong in playing that role? Okay, very quickly, if you could reply to that, please. I'll be very quick. Uh, in saying that uh, I think I'll need to speak to some other experts to, to find out exactly what can be done. But for now, I think, as I said, and also with a big warning sign on the top of, of my slide, um, the figures that I mentioned were 2010, 2018, just before the, the crackdown, so to speak, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and it might be too early to still, you know, definitively say 
what the effects are of the national security law. It depends on what kind of business you speak to. If you speak to logistics uh, people, bankers, you know, financial institutions, there Hong Kong is still the indispensable actor in the region. If you speak to other businesses, uh, I think f to take a Belgian example, Samsonite, the, the luggage you know, uh, uh, people, took out their entire division from Hong Kong and they moved to Singapore. So it depends on which business you are speaking about to see how important Hong Kong is, but on a financial side as a, as a sort of gateway, sorry, gateway as a kind of uh, channel for money to flow in and out of, of China, it's for the moment, you know, the time being, it's still very indispensable. What we can do about it, um, I mean, I'm not uh, an expert enough on these matters to go and, 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 and say with confidence uh, what should be done. Um, there we go, but I can come back to you on that maybe. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so on this note, I like to thank my fellow presenters for their presentations. I'd like to thank the questions raised and the audience generally for being here. So thank you very much for all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I welcome you to join us for a coffee break. And we reconvene here in 20 minutes uh, for the next panel on trade relations. Thank you.
thank you. I think it is now right on time. So I'm happy to give the floor to Johan Andersen to introduce the next panel and the next speakers. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to the second panel of the day. Let me thank by, uh, let me start by thanking the organizer for putting together this nice event and let me also thank SEPS for hosting us here. Uh, in our second panel, we will turn our focus from security to trade. Perhaps it's a bit of an artificial distinction that is in need of being torn down in light of the geoeconomic turn in the EU's trade policy. Um, as elaborated, as elaborated sorry, earlier, the panel is part of a Jean Monnet network that started from the observation of an increasingly geostrategic geo framing of EU trade policy. Now, in the project and the book that uh, stems from it, we explored the extent to which geostrategic rhetoric also translated itself into concrete policy consequences. Now, the book looks at the Asia-Pacific as a region, uh, as a geographic area where all global powers are becoming or have been increasingly assertive, not only just uh, China and the US, but also the EU has a growing interest at stake. Uh, it focuses on the negotiation of free trade agreements. And in the keynote this morning by Ms. Martin Pratia Broy, she referred to them as tools of real engagement. So in that sense, I think we feel vindicated by our choice to focus on these trade agreements. But as she also mentioned, we need to recognize that the strategy needs to start at home. So in that light, I'm also very pleased that we can welcome uh, Mallory Schaus to our panel. Uh, she will present last, uh, uh, but she uh, leads the forum of new industrial policy for Europe here at SEPS and can, can offer, I would say, perhaps also a complementary perspective to the focus that uh, the other authors or the contributors to the book provide. Uh, the remainder of the panel will consist uh, of three contributors to the book. First, there is my uh, co-editor, uh, Evgeny Posnikov from Melbourne University, who will give an overview of the book itself. He will replace Ferdi de Ville from Ghent University, who unfortunately called sick this morning. Um, second, we will have uh, Suyun Kim from the uh, University of Singapore, who will look at China as an assertive economic actor, a rival, a competitor in the region. And then a, first, uh, a third sorry, book contributor who replaces the equally sick, but perhaps she's online, Clara Weinhardt, uh, and that is Fabian Bonenberger, who is currently based at the UK mission to the European Union, and he will present his findings on the design and the use of the most favored nation clauses uh, in trade agreements. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would hand the floor over to uh, Evgeny. Okay, thank you. Can I ask for my slides? All right, okay, thanks very much. Uh, so thanks, um, Jochen, for the introduction. Um, I am one of the co-editors, uh, Evgeny Posnik of University of Melbourne. I was not supposed to be on this panel originally. Uh, I'm also on the panel in the afternoon <laughs> where I will try to actually integrate these two volumes uh, together a little bit um, more. But um, I had this uh, presentation ready because I presented the book um, uh, previous week at Korea University, one of our partner institutions. Um, now it was a different format, so I think I had a bit more time, so cut me off if um, you feel like I'm going for too long. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, but um, I would perhaps just start with um, explaining why we chose to um, write this volume and focus on the geoeconomics of EU FTAs in the Asia Pacific. So other than um, the fact that we got this grant from the European Commission, of course, <laughs> and it was um, tied to this um, uh, larger theme. Um, but we also had this kind of broader uh, theoretical and empirical ambition. Um, so we all, of course, hear about trade more and more these days. It's in the headlines, right? And it's often kind of framed in this language of high politics, right? So it's no longer this kind of technical, uh, boring issue um, that trade used to be. So, um, so it's a different time now, right? Things have changed. So there's increasing use of this geoeconomic, geostrategic rhetoric when it comes to um, trade politics more generally and EU trade policy in particular, right? So we talk, uh, we talk about this as a kind of high politics of trade, so high politics used to be more about security, right? In this day and age, it's actually also about trade, um, and um, 
and it's fun. And for some people like us teaching trade policy, all of a sudden um, we have so many more students <laughs> who are interested in it. So, um, so it's, it's, it's great news, right, for, for us uh, scholars, right? So, but it's certainly it's, it's very topical, right? And um, why FTAs? Well, because uh, in the world where the WTO has stalled, FTAs are used now as the key tool of trade governance, right? So most of trade liberalization efforts um, are bilateral, right, or plurilateral in this day and age, right? So they're done uh, more and more through FTAs, free trade agreements, right? Not so much uh, multilaterally anymore um, since the um, stalling of the Doha round of the WTO. And one, why Asia Pacific? Well, because uh, again, other uh, than the, <laughs> the fact that we had this grant and had to focus on the region, right, just, uh, I guess, conceptually, right, uh, theoretically, empirically, Asia Pacific is very important, right? So it's central in terms of um, its place in uh, trade and production networks, uh, networks, right? We talk about factory Asia, we talk about global value chains and how much sort of uh, the EU and other systemic uh, trade powers are interested in this region and how much they're connected uh, to this region uh, via their networks of FTAs and via global value chains, right? So trade and production networks and this region's centrality in those networks. Um, so, so, they, um, so these systemic powers have overlapping uh, trade uh, policy interests and FTAs with the region, right? So the EU is part of this kind of um, universe of um, uh, these FTAs uh, with Asia Pacific. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the the next one, please. Yes, right. So uh, again, just just how much um, um, the the usage, I guess, of this geoeconomic rhetoric uh, is reflected now, right? In in if, when we look at just the media coverage, right, of trade, a lot of this is covered, right, through the, this geoeconomic or geostrategic. Uh, frame, right? So here's just the figure showing just how much uh, the coverage of trade issues, right, over the years has been linked more and more with the kind of language on uh, geoeconomics, geopolitics, a geostrategic um, uh, frameworks, right? So uh, if we do this kind of uh, search uh, of the media coverage and newspaper articles mentioning trade. Next slide, please. Um, right, so and again, as I said, um, Obviously, countries have been signing PTAs, uh, something like 700 PTAs now, the last figure I heard, right? And most of those PTAs, uh, a huge chunk of them anyway, are in the Asia Pacific, right? So all systemic powers, right? Be those the US, the EU, China, um, right? Australia, not a systemic power, but middle power, um, right? So th th they all have multiple FTAs with countries in the region, and they are a huge chunk of just the overall um, FTA or PTA network, so preferential trade agreements, free trade agreements, we use those uh, often interchangeably. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an illustration, right? Um, and again, just further to, uh, to what I'm saying here, right, the EU has been actively signing uh, FTAs in the Asia Pacific, right? So, uh, so we think of sort of not just Asia here, Asia Pacific, including Australia and New Zealand, right? So there is now an agreement with New Zealand, so there is one being negotiated with, with Australia. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, um, very important regional um, um, partners there, right? Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, South Korea, um, right? And uh, some further opportun opportunities for the EU to sign um, uh, FTAs with other uh, regional powers, right? Including, um, of course, um, India, right? So, uh, the, uh, so we, we are talking today about the Indo-Pacific, right? Not, not so much Asia-Pacific uh, region, right? So. Um, India is there, right, and um, and other countries like Thailand, uh, Malaysia, right, where the negotiations have sort of stalled, but right, there's further potential there, right, and uh, um, and I won't mention China. Um, next slide, please. Right, so so the ambition of the volume, right, as I said, we, this, we had this kind of larger theoretical uh, conceptual ambition was to kind of probe this notion of geoeconomics and see how much it influences uh, the negotiation and design of free trade agreements, right, and how much uh, power considerations actually uh, play out, right, through the negotiations of um, EU FTAs with Asia Pacific um, countries, right? So, uh, and we st start with the premise here that um, FTAs actually can be used, right, to advance some geostrategic goals to advance power, and uh, they can be designed in a particular way, right, to allow countries negotiating FTAs to focus more 
foreign relative gains, right, vis-a-vis -vis their systemic competitors, right? So when the EU is negotiating an FTA with, um, I don't know, New Zealand, right, <laughs> it's, it's probably doing it with uh, an eye to CPTPP, right? So there are these kind of um, 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 overlapping, I guess, and, and competing often interests um, among these uh, very systemic uh, powers, right? So FTAs could be designed to potentially exclude uh, through the negative externalities, uh, uh, through various FTA provisions, to exclude systemic partners, or rivals, I should say, systemic rivals more from future FTAs uh, uh, who they might negotiate with the same partner, right? And et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so that was kind of our um, hunch here. And um, um, we drew on the literature on um, international political economy of trade, right? But it wasn't enough for us because a lot of the literature is on the design of PTAs, but the literature has become really technical and it really mainly focuses on domestic um, factors behind FTA negotiations and design. Well, here we want to actually explore some um, systemic factors, right? So power um, and rivalry and uh, competition, right? So we uh, try to... Um, marry uh, this uh, literature from international political economy with a literature um, on foreign policy analysis to help us uh, um, yeah, um, achieve this goal, right? And um, basically in the book that w we postulate that um, FTA um, can be designed, right, uh, to harness these negative externalities to help um, countries negotiating them to uh, achieve relative gains vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, right? But it's an empirical question whether they are designed in such a way. So that's what we're trying to understand in this book, how they can be designed and whether they are actually designed, right, to help the EU achieve geoeconomic gains, right? And we have this kind of neat framework where we explore this through three stages of FTA negotiation. So partner selection, how the EU at a, arrives at the decision to negotiate an FTA with a particular country and whether power considerations play a role there. Um, we look at the negotiation process and bargaining process itself, right, to see whether actually it makes it uh, harder, right, the fact that there might be some power considerations there or perhaps it facilitates negotiation of some FTAs and some issues within those FTAs. Uh, and we focus both on trade and non-trade aspects, of course, because FTAs are not, uh, they're not just free trade the agreements, not only uh, about trade, right, they're, they're about trade plus issues. And then we look at the design, right, whether well, the design of a final agreement actually reflects uh, some of these uh, geoeconomic and power considerations. Next slide, please. So here's the structure of the volume, um, right, so it's quite big and 15 chapters. And uh, so the first three chapters uh, sort of set the scene, uh, similar to the security volume, where we look at just kind of competition and interdependence in the region uh, broadly and what uh, the system powers do in the region uh, when it comes to their trade policies. So we look at the US, we look at China, which Suyo and Kim uh, will um, talk uh, more about. And we look um, at uh, the rise of global value <laughs> chains in the region, okay. So then we look at the various PTA provisions, right? So some, some that are really important, right? So non-trade provisions, intellectual property rights, uh, rules of origin, most favored nation, um, clauses, product standards, sustainable development, and, and we then have case studies just similar to uh, the security volume where we explore how all those issues, both systemic, right, and, um, um, and various other issues play out, right, uh, through the negotiation process uh, between the EU and partners. Next slide, please. Um, so, so here just a, a very brief overview uh, of the findings, and it's very sort of daunting because the, the, the volume is quite rich and there's more <laughs> there than what I put on the slides, right? And uh, and I'm also really jet lagged, so uh, uh, please pardon me, right? So, but of course, yeah, the region is uh, rife with geoeconomic tensions. Uh, those are not entirely new because some of the, what, what you know, supposed to talk about uh, rise of China, uh, some of those concerns over that rise uh, mirror actually the US, let's say, concerns of the rise of Japan, right? So uh, now um, we also find that these deep FTAs that the EU signed um, can be driven by geoeconomic concerns um, over global value chains, right, or um, uh, could be as equally driven by commercial interests and values, right? We would see sort of similar outcomes there. So it's often hard to distinguish actually what is there in the end, right? Um, is it driven by geoeconomic logic or by purely commercial interests and values? So, um, and trade can be, yes, uh, weaponized, of course, right? But it, and it is weaponized, but probably more by others than the EU, more by the US and China. So next slide, please. Um, and uh, you can skip that, so please. Um, uh, next one, yes. 
So maybe I'll just uh, skip this because we have some contributors here who will discuss some of their findings from uh, those um, issue chapters, right? So, but basically, I guess the, the, the key takeaway and point here is that uh, when it comes to the design of particular provisions in those FTAs, um, yes, it can be driven by relative gains, but it often is not driven by relative gains, right? So the EU often uh, insists on using multilateral rules and frameworks and um, in, in, um, when it comes to designing those provisions. Uh, so, so there's great potential actually for coordination with other partners there, right? So the EU chooses not to be kind of exclusionary, right? When it comes to the design of those um, key uh, provisions. Uh, next slide, and I think it's the final one. So, sorry, I'm <laughs> abusing my um, um, place here, right? So. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, right, so case studies, again, show us that, there, yes, there are some geoeconomic um, considerations playing out through the FTA negotiation. Most of them occur at the partner selection stage, right? So when the EU decides to engage in negotiation with, let's say, South Korea, right, that's, that's driven by some kind of systemic rivalry with the United States uh, and China, right, and South Korea can use those kinds of uh, rivalries to um, get certain concessions from the EU, as it has done, right? So there are these kind of parallel negotiations um, happening, right? So, but mainly when we look at the design of FTAs, it's um, mostly about commercial considerations, not so much geostrategic, geoeconomic considerations, right? So, so yes, some of those, some of that power kind of logic enters into this um, game, right? But it's mainly the partner selection stage. And I think, yeah, the, the last slide. Um, so please, yeah, that's, that's going to be the last one. Um, Next slide, please. Yes, so some takeaway message, message here, and uh, we can talk more about that and also in the afternoon, right? So, so yes, we see this kind of geoeconomic rhetoric, but it often supersedes reality. Um, so EU FTAs are not really weaponized for geoeconomic gains, maybe not yet, because there is a potential there, right? So, but the EU chooses not to do it in the same way that other systemic partners might, um, speaking about the US and China here. Um, and yes, uh, this leaves great um, uh, room for coordination with other other like-minded partners, uh, including middle powers like Australia, um, uh, through various stages um, uh, when it comes to implementation, for example, right? And yes, perhaps this reluctance to weaponize FTAs could be used as an anchor for stability in the region. Uh, so we're talking about, right, so what, what can kind of, how to build stability in the region, right? So, um, and I will talk more about this in the afternoon, <laughs> I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you could just put up my slides. Uh, my name is Suyan Kim. I am uh, from the political science department at the National University of Singapore. Um, I've been in Singapore for the last 12 years, honing my skills and expertise in the politics and the political economy of Asia. I'm just going filling the time while the, while the, uh, while the slides are, are going up. Um, I, I guess uh, I can also fill the space by saying what a pleasure it's been to work with um, Johan and Evgeny on this project. Um, I guess it's been a couple of years. And in the years, during the years that this project has been ongoing, um, the discourse changed from the Asia Pacific to the Indo Pacific. All right? So I don't know if it's a coincidence that the publication of this book, February, just coincided with the publication of the, <laughs> I'm sure it's not, the Indo Pacific strategy from the White House. We'll go on there. Okay. So, um, I, I think Yevgeny did not actually highlight the theoretical contribution, um, the scholarly contribution of this book when it comes, comes to conceptualizing and understanding um, geoeconomics. So this is what my way of saying I always welcome, right, as an academic all my life really, um, the opportunity to engage colleagues in the policy community. Um, in scholarly language, we call this translational research, but I always feel better when I know that, you know, I understand why what I study is actually relevant to the real world. So. Um, just to start us off on the right page, right? So geoeconomics in this, in this volume has a particular meaning, right? So it is the manipulation, okay? This, is, this that does not have to be politically aggressive or anything. Manipulation of one's position within the global networked economy in pursuit of strategic objectives. And FTAs, free trade agreements, are key elements of this economy, determining it, its network structure and the relationships among the players. So there's a great spatial element to understanding Right? What is geoeconomics uh, applied to Asia? So that really helps us, I think, to, to answer the really easy question, right? First, is there a geoeconomic turn to trade policy? Absolutely, certainly in Asia, right? Why is that? 
It is because um, geoeconomics is not new, but the strategic element, right, has never been more important. I think, at least in my in my recent, you know, the recent decades, let's just say. <laughs> so we want to highlight here, right, the competition between the United States and China. Right? Great power rivalry has always been part of regional integration, the process of regional integration in Asia. It right? explains why there were few institutions in the beginning, right? Um, and it's a whole different story why we have so many FTAs now that has more sort of a different kind of explanation. But great power rivalry now, right, centered in Asia between the United States and China really forms the part, sort of the fabric, right, really of our economic interactions, I think. Right? And I would argue as such. Next slide, please. All right. So the strategic context. A lot of this you already know, but I thought we would sort of touch them, right, each of them, sort of just to check in with them to know that we're sort of, we're looking at the same sort of milestones, if you will, right, markers. So the Biden administration's trade policy has not really reversed any of the Trump tariffs. So the U.S. trade war continues, right, fourth year in a row, right? But they've had an impact. If you want to follow trade, you know, um, you know, check out Chad Bounds, right, tracking of all the trade flows since the trade war, right? There have been reductions, great reductions in trade. Right. The restrictions on Chinese investments we're seeing not, in the, not just in the United States, but in through investment and cre screening mechanisms in Europe as well, right, have you know, generated an, a, a, an emerging scholarship of their own. Right. Now, the Biden administration has also announced export controls right, on Chinese access to advanced technology. Right. And last but not least, the Indo-Pacific strategy. Right. So it's very, very important to know that the, the Indo-Pacific strategy explicitly right, notes that the intent is not to change China but rather to alter the strategic environment around it, right? So the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that has recently been announced is really mobilizing, right? Like-minded states, I don't know, for cooperation in a way to cooperate in strategic, uh, changing the strategic environment around China. Right? On the Chinese side, you know, we're just coming out of the 20th Party Congress. Right? So we live in the age of data science, so it's easy to say, computer, please check how many, you know, which words you know, are most frequently found in, in, in these speeches. Security right, is the most important. Right? Um, it's much more important than in previous party congresses, right? along with others. This is a, you know analysis done by political, not, not, not me, so it's like well-sided there. Also, China's own institution building efforts, you know, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Belt and Road Initiative, and right, uh, the most recent, uh, the largest free trade agreement that's ever been signed, the mega free trade agreement, that's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Right. Um, and I'll sort of talk in that context in, in just, a, just a few minutes. Next slide, please. Okay, having said that. I'm trying to remember what is the next slide. Ah, you have seen this slide before. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, oh, thank you very much. Okay, some I, I, I like pictures a lot because they, of course, they say many, many words than I can, even if I speak very quickly. So this is uh, EU's trade, uh, EU and China trade. The red one shows the red line. So in the figure above shows EU's exports. Sorry, uh, Chinese exports to. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Chinese exports. Um, to the EU, the blue one, Chinese imports, right, from the EU. In both cases, they're riding, rising. The more interesting figure is in the two bottom, right, the two bottom ones. On the left, right, this is, I think, um, excuse me, thank you, um, right, this is a con trade concentration as a proportion of total Chinese trade. So Chinese, China's trade with the EU, right, in terms of proportion, Right, in terms of importance at a trading partner vis-a-vis -vis all other trading partners, has, has made, uh, sort of more or less remained stable across time. Right. The other side is more interesting. This is EU's uh, trade. Right. So this is uh, China-EU trade as a proportion of total EU trade. So EU's trade, EU's, so, sorry, China's importance to the EU as a trade partner has been increasing over time. We get both imports and exports. So this is the situation when it comes to the importance of right, the EU and China in each other's trading and sort of total trade right, with the world. Next slide, please. So these, uh, Evgeny has already put this slide up. So if you want to take a picture, this is your second chance to take the picture. Right? We need to make one adjustment since the New Zealand agreement, the EPA, has been concluded. Right? I understand it's not expected to go into effect until like at least 2024. But nevertheless, the negotiations have concluded. Yeah. OK, next one, please. So this is where I, we exploit the theoretical contribution of this volume, right? If you accept the argument that who you're connected to, right, matters, then who 
EU is connected to actually matters. In the case of here, the case is the two mega FTAs right now in the region. All right, so the CPTPP, which is the, I guess, the, the, uh, the, the inheritor of the TPP, right? And then the second column has the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. So the, 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 we have members, I sort of divided the members into those only in CPTPP, those only in RCEP, but not in the other, and then in the last one, signatories to both agreements. The countries that are bolded, right, all have FTAs with the EU. Right. This is really, I think, the geoeconomic right, uh, part of, of this, this, particular, this chapter or this analysis, is that these countries are the ones that have the links to the EU. More importantly, EU has links to Asia by way of these countries, right? at least when it comes to uh, uh, links through these trade agreements, through these institutions. So Canada, Chile, Mexico, Peru, in the case of the CPTPP, the RCEP, the Phil South Korea, and then let me just see signatories to both of them. We would have to add New Zealand, of course, but Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam, right? Are different ways in which the, uh, the EU can, right, somehow influence, shape, participate um, in um, the, the, the uh, trading networks, right, that are currently there, even if they have membership in neither, right, of the agreements. Last slide, please. So I leave you, so I thought, um, we have a really broad view, right? And it's a really important question to ask, for, certainly for this crowd, what role for the EU in Asia, right? Um, I think even if we cannot separate really the strategic from the economic right, engagement, in terms of practical, I think, approaches, the economic engagement versus strategic does, does actually matter, right? And that debate is worth having, right? The other question is whether it engage China or whether you engage Asia. Mm -hmm. um, the last one, right? And this one, of course, has a very long and very beloved, you know, sort of following, right? And any student of regional integration is that the European Union, of course, is the most advanced regional integration you know, project on the planet. Closely behind is the ASEAN economic community. In many ways, it is, it is, it is like a, you know, decades later, sort of par par following it, sort of a parallel process. In t especially when we look at areas of what we call harmonization of regulatory frameworks. Something that was really interesting, I think, in the process of European integration, it's just as interesting now, right, in, in Asian regional integration. So one area where this is really sort of nice to watch is in something as, so you might think it's boring, customs facilitation. The fact that in the ASEAN region now, you have one customs window Right, they started with five countries, but now it's expanded to all 10. You have one customs window, all digitized, right? Any trader exporting form will simply have to log on, right? And they will be subject, they will have only one form or one common set of forms to fill out for their products to move from country to country. All right, so I, I leave you with that and I look forward to your feedback, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Fabian. Thank you for the slides. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks for the organizers um, for inviting us to present this chapter. And so my co-author, Clara Reinhardt, is unfortunately sick, so she sends her apologies. Um, one other thing that I have to say before I start, I now work at the UK mission to the European Union, but this research was conducted while I was still at King's College in London. So the presentation here and that research is not the position of the UK government, so I'm here in a personal capacity. Um, my colleagues here on the panel have made it very easy for me to follow up with their great uh, kind of introductions and kind of setting out the broader trade context, setting out the definition of geoeconomics and the strategic context. So thank you very much. I was a little bit concerned when I um, wrote that presentation that we would be kind of dive in too deep, too quickly, because my presentation, as you can see, is on the evolution and the use of most favored nation clauses in FTA, so very design specific. Um, but let me introduce my arguments, um, our arguments. So first we observe that in FTAs, um, MFN is increasingly perceived and used as a strategic trade tool to shield exporters from economic competitors and to lock in preferential market access. 
second, we also find that the BRICS countries have so far made much less use of MFN clauses in their FTAs compared to major Western trading nations. And third, we argue that the geostrategic, geoeconomic calculus behind the use of MFN clauses remains untested. So their practical implications are often still uncertain, um, which also opens the door to unintended consequences of including them in these agreements. But let's quickly make sure, and next slide please, um, that we are all on the same page as far as what an MFN clause is. So what is MFN treatment? It simply means that um, preferential market access that is granted to the most favored nation, so the trade partner with the best, the most liberalized access to the market, that this market access also needs to be granted to other states. So in that sense, liberalization commitments are extended to other trade partners if they have negotiated an MFN clause. Next slide, please. Um, so coming to our first argument that in bilateral and regional trade agreements, MFN is increasingly perceived as a strategic trade tool. Um, we argue that the increasing number and variety of these MFN clauses that I included shows that Western governments are, have this growing interest in shielding exporters um, from competition. This also means that MFN clauses in FTAs can be seen as an example of the growing geopolitization of trade policy. Although how assertive the EU and others are enforcing these MFN clauses, another question I'll come to that later. Next slide, please. So historically, when we're thinking about MFN, um, we move along this spectrum. Um, the reasons to include MFN clauses in trade agreements have shifted over time between the liberal principle of encouraging open and free trade on the one hand and the more kind of mercantilistic tendency to discriminate against economic competitors. And this is seen here so on the one hand of the spectrum, we know that the MFN clause is the cornerstone of the multilateral trade system. So Article 1 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, of course, is that fav famous general MFN clause. But the recent use of these MFN clauses in FTAs um, has returned MFN more towards the other end of the spectrum, so the more to its kind of medieval origins as a strategic tool to preserve and protect market access. Um, and the EU and others have kind of rediscovered these advantages of including MFN clauses to lock in economic advantages. Can I have the next slide? So how does this work? Um, first, um, and this is a very similar slide to the one that um, Evgeny has already shown you. Um, so this, is a, this depicts the various FTAs that have been negotiated over the last decades. And the black and gray areas of these various bars, these suggest, or these show which agreements include a services or an investment MFN clause or both. So the darker, the more MFN clauses. So we have relatively good data on the inclusion of services and investment clauses. This is why I'm showing you these here especially. So you can see also that the share in terms of like in the more recent agreements, there are more and more agreements where both a services and an investment MFN clause are included. Um, MFN clauses also appear in other areas um, increasingly, for example, on intellectual property rights or in the area of technical barriers to trade. Next slide, please. Um, in goods, in the area of goods, we have less of these MFN clauses, but I have an example here from the negotiations between the EU and the East African community on a, of an economic partnership agreement. And here again, we have a goods MFN clause that basically means that the East African community partners shall accord to the EU any more favor favorable treatment they, receive, they grant to another major trading economy 
defined as any developed country or any trade partner accounting for more than 1% of merchandise trade. So again, here we see how MFN is used to protect preferential market access of EU exporters and perhaps even to disincentivize African trade partners from granting more favorable treatment to other third countries. Next slide, please. So if we then kind of think about how MFN is perceived as this strategic tool in the context of our research, we conduct various interviews of EU officials and they argue that overall the EU needs to be less naive on trade. And this would mean using tools like MFN to capture any better deal that partners may conclude in the future. For example, the EU Mercosur FTA, which is still under negotiation, seems to contain a clause on public procurement that, is, that looks like an MFN clause and that would protect EU suppliers um, against the scenario where Mercosur states uh, would offer better treatment to others, let's say China, for example. Um, all this seems to indicate um, a return of MFN clauses in FTAs um, towards realizing their strategic potential and their intention to kind of lock in a privileged trade relationship. Next slide, please. Let me quickly get to our second argument that the BRICS countries have so far used MFN clause in FTAs much less than other countries. Next slide. Um, we can see this here. So this is just a breakdown of how many FTAs of these various countries include MFN clauses. And if you direct your attention to the middle column here in yellow, um, you can see that the BRICS countries include much less MFN clauses in their agreements, both on services and investment. One explanation is that the FTAs might be much more narrow. They might not include services and investment um, chapters. But then you see that China here is at least an exception. Um, they are using MFN clauses more frequently, at least compared within their group. Next slide, please. Um, our third argument that the geostrategic calculus behind MFN clauses remains untested. So, next slide. Um, what we found is that one of their main uses of these MFN clauses might be limited to them being a tactic in the negotiations of free trade agreements. So they can serve both on the offensive and on the defensive side. So on the offensive side, they can help negotiators secure better market access offers from the beginning, because if you include an MFN clause, it doesn't really make sense to start with a bad market access offer because you bind your hands for future negotiations. While on the defensive end, um, you can hide behind an MFN clause and can say, well, we can't really offer you that because we have already committed to extending that to a, various, to a variety of other trade partners. So that would reduce the benefit to that in that negotiation or to that specific trade partner because they wouldn't have this preferential market access to their own. Um, the other observation is that the willingness to actually test the legal and practical implica implement, kind of implications of these MFN clauses seems relatively low for now. We, and maybe someone in the audience can correct me on us on that. We haven't really come across a lot of existing monitoring whether these FTA clauses are, or whether trade partners are actually complying with these MFN commitments that they made or actually where MFN is kind of extended because other negotiations went farther than was kind of the market access that existed in the original agreement. Last slide, please. So let me just wrap this up. Our conclusion, again, we find an increasing use of MFN on both services and investment, especially in FTAs. And we think this is in line with the broader kind of geopolitization in trade politics. We find that the EU and other major trading nations are increasingly using MFN clauses in FTAs, but that the, especially the BRICS countries, except for China, have not really picked up on this trend yet. 
And finally, we find that the geostrategic calculus behind that remains to at least to some degree untested. Um, but that this may be changing now, especially when we look at the EU and its increasing focus on FTA enforcement and implementation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so y you may turn to okay to the next slide. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation and for joining your panel. I'm going actually to complement uh, the aspect of MFN uh, MFN in uh, looking at other. Uh, EU uh, instruments. So actually at SEPS we are assessing the UN international trade policies, notably as part of uh, our SEPS Forum on the Future of European Industry, where we discuss the new industrial strategy for Europe. And the EU trade policy review has been released in February of last year, just between the first and the second enhanced versions of the EU industrial strategy. So in February of last year. And at the same time, the very foundation of the EU trade policy is the same foundation as the new industrial strategy for Europe, which is this overarching concept of open strategic autonomy. And on this basis, we can already see a sign of a geopolitical, I prefer geopolitical turn in EU trade policy. And when one is saying geopolitical turn, there is a risk of enhanced protectionism. Now the EU trade policy review is named explicitly an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy. And it has an annex on the WTO reform, so the rules-based multilateral trading system. So it confirms the traditional openness of the EU trade policy, but it also underlines a reorientation of this EU trade policy towards enhanced sustainability, resilience, and also, and this is the aspect that I'd like to, to underline, greater assertiveness against unfair trade practices. And regarding this last point of greater assertiveness, we may indeed observe over the past years, an increasing number of legal acts that have been proposed by the Commission of this type of nature, so greater assertiveness. And there is even more recently an acceleration in this respect. So if we, uh, if we uh, list them, uh, some of them, the first one has been the EU framework regulation on the screening of FDI in 2019, implementation November 2020. We have now the Commission, which is most probably very soon becoming a regulation, which is the regulation on foreign subsidies distorting the internal market. It's currently in the formal process of adoption by the Parliament and the Council. Then we may also mention the very recent proposal by the Commission on the ban on products that are produced, that are met with forced labour. And the proposal that I'd like to discuss more in depth with you is the proposal that has been released in December of uh, last year, which is a proposal for regulation on the protection of the Union and the Member States from economic coercion from, uh, by third countries. The common positions by the Parliament and Council have been adopted recently in October and November of this year, and so the trilogue is going to start in this respect. Before, so I think that's the... Uh, next slide. So before now going into, so I'm a lawyer, so before going into the legal analysis of the, uh, the anti-coercion instrument proposal, I'd like to make some preliminary remarks or, uh, with respect to all these different uh, instruments, proposals uh, adopted or soon to be adopted. First, all these uh, proposals show the seeds of a geopolitical turn in EU trade policy. All are of a rather defensive approach at the EU level. But all are walking on a very fine line between protection of EU and member states' interests, 
protection for reasons of security, sometimes for reasons of econ uh, economic reasons or other legitimate purposes like forced labor. But this fine line, on the other side, there is the risk of enhanced protectionism, uh, of course. And this risk, we'll see whether it's going to be realized through the implementation of these diverse acts. And so there is a risk of what may be called disarticulation between politics, economics, or other grounds, where politics trumps the other grounds, and importantly, even the economic ground, for instance, with the soon to be the regulation on foreign subsidies. And there is, and this is the point of view of the lawyer, a risk, therefore, also of a disarticulation with respect to the rules-based multilateral trading system. Sometimes due to the fact that this system has some weaknesses and that the process of reform, of discussions, of negotiations is rather slow at the international level. We are living in an imperfect world, but the medium to long-term horizon remains the rules-based multilateral trading system. So the challenges that we are currently facing should be transformed into opportunities. And one opportunity that I will discuss is the WTO reform. And in this respect, the EU has a key global leadership role to play. I think it's the, it's the new slide. Yeah, there is a new slide. So let's discuss a bit uh, legally, and I try to be uh, quite simple, uh, this anti-coercion instrument uh, proposal. It is a response to a rising trend of using economic coercive measures against developed countries. And it is expected to last over the coming decades. Now this proposal uh, is designed to ensure, and this is important to understand, an effective and importantly a swift response with respect to those measures of economic coercion. Now, those measures of economic coercion are defined as measures taken by a third country that seeks to coerce either the union or one of its member states or more than just one of its member states in interfering in the legitimate sovereign policy choices of the EU or of the member states. And this through the use or threat of use of measures that are affecting trade or investment. Now, the primary aim of this anti-coercion instrument proposal by the EU is to be a deterrent. So there is a list of countermeasures that are, uh, that are listed in the annex to the proposal. And so it's first, it's first in the b first best position would be not to use it, but that it be a deterrent. Now, if de-escalation is not possible after dialogue, after possible agreed uh, solutions, uh, after possible adjudicated solutions, then countermeasures could be uh, imposed. In the commission proposal, it's for the commission to impose it, but based on the comitology rules, so with the agreement of the member states. Now, as this countermeasures would be already a response to unilateral protectionist measures, the measures of economic coercion, there are legitimate concerns of escalation, of enhanced protectionism, of further undermining of the multilateral system. Now, this, now the EU nevertheless elevates a bit this debate on unilateralism in founding the proposal into the rules-based system, but specifically public international law. So in other words, it considers that the measures of economic coercion that may be imposed, for instance, by China or by another country, these measures may indeed, in public international law, under certain circumstances, be considered a breach of the principle of non-intervention of the UN Charter. And so the countermeasures that are provided in the proposal are actually justified to the extent that they are response measures to an internationally illegal act. And this based on the ILC Articles of State Responsibility. But the great weakness of 
yeah, the great, it's the last point now, the great weakness of this proposal, this comes from a WTO lawyer, is that it completely disregards the relevance of WTO law. But as I mentioned, when you speak about economic coercion, you speak about trade and investment restrictions, be it the measure of economic coercion or the countermeasures. These are tariffs, quotas, etc. And this is a great weakness, but the justification put forward by the Commission is to say there is a coercive act, a coercive intention, you want to interfere in our legitimate sovereign choices, this is actually what we tackle with the countermeasures. And we do not tackle, and this has to be distinguished, from the trade or investment restriction with the protectionist intention. But then I have a question for me, even though we can distinguish both objectives, so the, uh, the coercive obje objective and the protectionist objective, both are very closely related and mutually reinforcing each other. If I take the trade measure with this protectionist intention, it's actually to support, to essentially support the coercive intention to interfere in the sovereign choices of the Union or the member states. And I think that the key question here to ask is the question of the instrumentality of the countermeasures. Is to say, can we consider the countermeasures that the EU would adopt to be instrumental, that's to say, to lead to the cessation of the measures of economic coercion, if those countermeasures do not target, as argued by the Commission, do not target the trade or investment restriction. This I'm very much wondering. And given the nature of the countermeasures that are either quotas, tariffs, suspension of rights in services, given the nature, most of those countermeasures are going to fall within the ambit of WTO law and the core competence of the WTO. And so there is a risk that the countermeasures be contrary and that the regulation be contrary to WTO law, at least to the extent that there would be the adoption and the application of countermeasures. Remember, the first the primary aim is to be deterrent, so not to use countermeasures. But if the EU starts to use countermeasures, there could be a problem with WTO law. But this, but this two, uh, two minutes, <laughs> uh, two, two minutes uh, still for finalizing, if I may. So here, the point is that there is a risk, it's a challenge, but the EU should use opportunities. And one of the opportunities is the WTO reform, and what is, uh, what is uh, stated, a re restoration of the WTO dispute settlement system by 2024. So in two years, and the EU should use this. So let me be a bit more specific. Where is actually the problem with WTO law and the countermeasures? It's Article 23 of the DSU. Article 23 of the DSU provides that WTO disputes have to be exclusively resolved by the WTO dispute settlement system. So not unilaterally as the EU wants to do, but based on public international law in the EU. So, but on the other hand, we understand that the EU wants to be swift in its response. So for this, there is a need to reform the WTO dispute settlement system, which is known to have weaknesses, lengthy procedures, not the possibility to impose directly provisional measures against the measures of economic coercion in this case. And so there, the EU should use the WTO reform to improve the WTO dispute settlement system. And as you know, the US, all this year, there have been discussions led by the US to, uh, to understand, to have a common ground as to what should be, uh, the, the, what should be the, the aspects of the WTO dispute settlement system to be reformed. Now, to the extent that the countermeasures would have to be justified under WTO law, it could be justified under general international law, as I mentioned, so the ILC Articles of State Responsibility. But as we know, general international law cannot be applied 
in WTO law, so by the WTO adjudicating bodies, to the extent that they are not referred to in WTO law. And so there, there would also be a need to provide for the possibility of applying general international law within WTO law, so as part of the WTO dispute settlement system. And this would not only be good for the aspect of economic coercion, but also for other global issues such as sustainability, as we know that there is also a turn towards sustainable, uh, tr uh, sustainable trade. Now, in the long term, but it's just uh, one point, in the, in the long term, it would be good to have an exception on economic coercion. It would be developed, but this is long term, and it would allow to clearly, more clearly distinguish economic coercion from the national security exception. And there I mentioned one case that already indirectly recognizes uh, a possibility for the WTO to discuss this aspect. So the conclusion, which is uh, the following uh, slide, is to say that there is a necessary geopolitical turn in EU trade policy with an implied disarticulation between disciplines and the risk of enhanced protectionism. And therefore, it's very important for the EU as a, in its key global leadership role to continue in the, uh, the efforts with other major players, the US, China, in support of the rules-based multilateral trading system, where actually, uh, which is actually the medium to long-term horizon uh, for uh, continuing economic relationships at, uh, at the global level and in rather peaceful, uh, in rather peaceful term. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for these nice presentations. I think it is time to open up the floor to any sort of questions or comments that you may have. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, also indicate to whom, to whom you'd address it. Um, would I have a first volunteer? It's always difficult. Uh, and of course, introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to invite also our online audience to ask questions. We actually have quite a, a number that are following us online. And please post it, and we have uh, someone that will revert your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for uh, very substantive uh, presentations. And uh, I have uh, a comment uh, on uh, EU's industrial policy, and uh, particularly on that uh, anti cohesion uh, instrument. I find uh, overall those uh, overall those industrial policies are very complex. And uh, I'm afraid, for example, those IPR, industrial subsidies, uh, due diligence, uh, uh, sustainable development, anti-forced labor, all those are so complex. And I'm afraid uh, uh, the effect uh, is really questionable. And on that uh, anti-cohesion uh, instrument, uh, I find that, uh, I mean, to implement that, uh, we need to prove intention injuries and to establish a causal link. And uh, overall, I'm just wondering that uh, cohesion behaviors or are they just uh, simply uh, trade disputes? And uh, I understand that uh, this cohesion instrument is uh, very much uh, focused on that uh, China-Lithuania uh, dispute, but uh, uh, maybe uh, that was just China's tantrum. And uh, because I lately spoke with Lithuania and uh, they told me that apparently China and Lithuania have started trading again. And uh, so that is my general comment. Thank you. So thanks very much, Wayneian. So yes, it is complex. Yes, it is a network of uh, measures. Yes, there is an acceleration uh, in uh, in the in the proposals and most probably also in the adoption because 
it's quite there was quite certainty that uh, even the anti-corrosion instrument proposal is going to be uh, adopted soon, most probably 2023. Uh, now the now so the effect is questionable. Yes, it can lead. Uh, that's the risk of enhanced protectionism. But if I may just take one example, um, which is the the soon-to-be regulation on foreign subsidies distorting uh, the internal market. Yes, there is a bias uh, towards uh, foreign subsidies that are considered to be distortive. But when you look at, uh, at the, the final agreement uh, that has been uh, found, and you just look at Article 5, the Balancing Act, and you look at the Annex, you'll understand that uh, even though uh, that there is some restraint. When you, when you take the Commission's proposal on foreign subsidies, the same article, Balancing Act, there was a lot of discretionary power which was left to the Commission, and the positive effects were no longer, compared to the White Paper, were no longer referred to and explained. In the final political agreement, there seems to be a, a quite uh, strong rationale behind in the fact that there is less discretionary power for the Commission, that the positive effects, there is some reference to what should be understood by a positive effect, and in the annex it's referred to that the Commission is going to develop guidance. So the approach when you look from the white paper to the Commission's proposal to the final political agreement uh, on this regulation, you understand that there are, uh, that there are um, that they are really cautious in what they are doing, thanks to the interplay of different institutions in this respect. With respect to the coercive behavior and the question of causal link, you are completely right, it's the question of attribution. So to what extent can we uh, attribute, and this is a very delicate issue in public international law and even in, uh, in, uh, in WTO law. So there you are completely, uh, completely right, and I haven't been uh, in depth in how we could actually uh, how economic coercion, economic coercive measures may actually be considered inconsistent with public international law or uh, m uh, more broadly WTO law. So I haven't been in depth, but we can discuss afterwards about this. That's really a key point and a key issue. Thank you very much for very detailed and comprehensive presentations. In the first presentation, there was a mention of power, spatially defined. I wonder what that means, because my experience, and I was involved in the negotiation with Korea at the time for the FDA EU Korea, I had the feeling that the power on both sides was completely different. The EU has enormous powers, not only because of its market, even the intellectual power of its negotiating team was quite different from the uh, Korean, and this is not only the case with Korea, it's with others as well. So bilateral for me already seems to be a problem because there's an enormous difference in the negotiations between small partners and the EU as such. We are representing now 27 countries, and we have on the other side of the table only one, sometimes even small country. Is, this, uh, is your power not very influential in the long term? Particularly see in the case of Korea, where we clearly saw afterwards that the trade was m very much in favor, the bilateral trade of the EU, and the Koreans had problems to catch up using the FTA in their favor. Thank you. Um, a question for Dr. Schaus, a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, specific to the plethora of institutions uh, that are going to act as a filter, so to speak, uh, to the risks of a protectionist uh, attitude and policy outcomes, uh, fallout really from the anti-coercive measures. I understand that there's also a tug of war uh, within the Europe, the Union, uh, um, specific to uh, big players uh, that uh, might, have want, might want to push for the anti-coercive law and others, smaller ones, but are <coughs> much more interested in preserving uh, the competitive dynamics also within the Union and a more liberal, free, uh, 
declination of, of, uh, um, uh, of, a, of world trade. And how to square that circle? Because I understand that not just a, uh, I understand that not just as a tension between the heft and perhaps the uh, uh, political economic outlook uh, of big players such as France, Germany, and Italy uh, relative to others, but also the heft that there is the, the gap between these big economies and the others. And how do you square the circle between also the tension there is, of course, between the competitive dynamics uh, that are certainly going to be at play within the Union uh, because interests don't necessarily align. Um, to give you a, a, an example, if uh, France were to be informally sanctioned uh, uh, by China or the United States uh, uh, through, for instance, banning of wine, uh, exports of wine uh, to their country, <clears throat> I'm not so sure that uh, the Italian uh, uh, government would actually coalesce and run to, uh, to save French wine. In fact, it might actually find an opening uh, to, uh, to, to, to bolster its sales uh, in that particular market. This is, of course, uh, a, uh, a, a silly example, and I'm uh, uh, waiting uh, to stand to be corrected. Uh, thank you very much. It's right that, uh, yes, in, in these terms, you may be completely right. It's just the only answer that I have is normally that uh, voila, the common commercial policy is an EU exclusive competence uh, and that it should remain, uh, remain so. Um, and then to what extent, so I'm a lawyer, so to what extent now the, uh, the, the politics between states has to be, uh, has to be dealt with um, is a bit more difficult for me to answer except that, and it's not the first uh, time that, uh, that this question comes to me, uh, the same question is with uh, FTAs and the power relationship between the different uh, countries. It's uh, at the end, uh, at least for the legislative process of the measures that are proposed, is uh, it is the Commission and then the Parliament and, uh, and the Council. But it's right that, for instance, with the anti-coercion instrument proposal, uh, there is a tension uh, between, uh, between the, the, the Commission and the Council, the Council wanting uh, to have more power uh, because those measures are, at, including this one, at the intersection between the, uh, the common foreign and security policy and the common commercial policy. And this will be an increasing, uh, 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 an increasing issue because we are at the interlink of both, but the anti-coercion instrument proposal by the Commission has been based on the common, uh, common commercial policy and has completely avoided. So it avoids the common uh, security uh, and foreign policy in this respect, except the comitology rules that are applied. Uh, that are applied. Uh, and so that's why all my argument also goes towards uh, the trade and the multilateral uh, trading system. Voilà. But that's, uh, an, that's an issue that is going to, to be increasing because we are at the interlink of both uh, disciplines. Um, shall I take the question on the spatial dimensions of power then. Um, perhaps to the specific case of Korea, I think there we noticed it mostly on the, the Korean side where it was part of their strategy as well to first negotiate with big partners because in the region they feared also competition by Japan. So they had a, a deliberate strategy to first target the US uh, and Korea. Um, also with the aim then that it would gain expertise, which you mentioned is also a source of power, but that sort of power could then be used in other or leveraged in other uh, negotiations. Um, in the e on the EU side, we mostly saw it, and that I think also resonates with what we mentioned earlier, this sort of rhetorical dimension that in the European Parliament, for example, when the agreement was up for adoption, this framing as, uh, if we adopt it now, we were ahead of the US, because the US at the time was renegotiating the terms, uh, again also with reference to what the EU got. So you see this sort of uh, linking of these different trade agreements and the outcomes that they've got in different trade agreements. So that's what we meant with this, mean with the sort of spatial dimension of power that um, for a specific mem for a specific country, you can leverage the networks that you have, or you can become more powerful. I think, for example, for Singapore, uh, because it was the first of the ASEAN countries, it also could weigh a bit more because what uh, what Singapore could get was also 
the pamphlet that they would offer to different uh, countries and in the region. So because these agreements are all linked, either through the use of pamphlets or because they lock into and are then causes specific commitments, they become uh, linked. And that can be a source of power or pre uh, also weakness. That's what we mean with the spatial dimension of power. Does that more or less? Uh, is, there, is there still room for m more questions? We have five minutes, so I think we can take can see one more. Yeah. Can I also sneak in one myself? Of course. Okay, yeah. sorry. Because uh, <coughs> I also like the presentation and discussion that we've been having, and I thought about a, a quote by Barry Posen when he said, uh, the, the multipolar order basically means that this will be the golden age for diplomats. But if I hear the discussion now, also a bit, it may also be a golden age for, for lawyers, uh, and trying to figure out how to reconcile <laughs> the sort of, uh, how to reconcile these geostrategic ambitions uh, with, the, with the commercial ones, or perhaps one of bureaucrats that have to, to filter out uh, or have to look over the implementation of all of these specific for trade uh, in, entrenched and interlocked agreements. So I would like to, to, to raise also the question to the panel, to what extent or what is actually the future of, of not the EU's, but basically the global trade regime? Is it going to become a much more diplomatic IR type of focused arena where we have a lot more litigation and everything that comes with it, or is it perhaps more also on the practical side? Um, sorry, that, that's my question, but I, there was one more from the audience. Uh, thank you, uh, Yang Li from uh, Institute of China Europe Studies. And I uh, just to seek a quick point of uh, clarification from Mallory, that uh, you talked a lot about uh, violation of international law. So in your view, does the violation of international law uh, serve as a prerequisite to trigger uh, defensive trade measures against coercive uh, measures. Thank you. Okay. To answer directly your question, uh, yes. So you have first, when you have a measure of economic coercion, it's really a delicate issue, but under certain circumstances, it may be considered, but the standard is quite high, it may be a breach of the principle of non-intervention. So we go, we, we actually extend what is normally in the defense sector to the economic sector, but this is already recognized since uh, the 1970s. So there, it may be a breach of the principle of non-intervention, and because it becomes then on this basis, but based on a high standard, because it becomes then an internationally wrongful act, countermeasures under certain circumstances may be imposed, so by the EU, may be imposed against this, uh, against this measure of economic coercion. And these are the ILC, so the International Law Commission's Articles of State Responsibility that allow for this. So this, is, uh, so this is the justification, but that's public international law. And actually the issue, when you uh, the issue is that the international legal order, if it exists, <laughs> the international legal order is still fragmented. So what is important now to, to, to think uh, through is how to combine all these different systems and notably the application, for instance, of general international law and WTO law. It's not just for economic coercion, but it's other global issues like sustainability. And Professor Pauline, Jos Pauline, has done his thesis on this issue of the interlink between general international law and other, uh, and other uh, international legal systems, such as the WTO uh, legal uh, system. Now, regarding the lawyers, we are very much contested now at the WTO. So we, had, we have had our gold age since 95, so since WTO exists. Now, with uh, the, the, the issue of uh, the WTO dispute settlement system, for instance, uh, we are, and even I think in a speech of uh, the Director General of last December at Louise uh, School, if I remember well, she was pointing to the lawyers because of the lawyers, it was not going uh, well at, uh, at the WTO. Uh, I think that we are a necessary part uh, of the discussion, and I think that thanks to law, the system may be a strong rules-based 
multilateral trading system, system that is essential for the predictability and security of the multilateral system. And this security and predictability is something that we lawyers share with the other disciplines, including political science and economics. Maybe I add to your question because it seemed to <laughs> go some, somehow in my direction as well. Um, on, on the multipolar kind of system and especially on this kind of relationship between diplomats and lawyers, well, um, and also thanks for making me feel good about my career choice, like moving from academia to <laughs> diplomacy. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that lawyers will very soon be out of a job. I mean, the move from the multilateral to more bilateral and regional agreements and so on does not mean that suddenly we don't need lawyers. I mean, in fact, I mean, more agreements probably also like mean more need for interpretation of what the various provisions mean and maybe more disputes. Like, who knows? I mean, also, if you look at like what the EU does with the various autonomous tools like foreign subsidies instrument, anti-coercion instrument, and so on, you already alluded to that, the definition of what a foreign subsidy is or what constitutes economic coercion and how does that interrelate with existing law, that will not mean you're out of a job very soon, I think. Um, on, on, Joseph, on generalists, like will we see a lot of IR generalists um, in trade circles? Well, um, I hope not. <laughs> um, as a lot of the provisions, I think, and a lot of the implementation work is very technical. And as soon as we're speaking about specific issues like implementation of services provisions, investment provisions, and all of that, there's a very steep learning curve for generalists, so yeah. <laughs> also a lot of like opportunities, I guess, for academics on trade policy to skill, to upskill the generalists. Thanks. Shall we then close the session by thanking the speakers? I would also like to thank the audience for the questions asked uh, and can we go for lunch? Yes, great. So, so thank you. So thank you very much. So for the ones who are joining us uh, in person, please join us for lunch downstairs. For the ones joining us virtually, well, please enjoy your lunch. And let's reconvene here at 2.
measured? What kind of measures there are? Because we know only from counterweighting and anti-dumping duties to impose duties or restrictions on imports. Are, is there any other means to impose on the trading against uh, the duties? Uh, again, this process yeah, is measured. After the deterrence, once it's established what to measure, <coughs> what kind of measures are proposed? Uh, the, 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 basic, the, the basic failure to enable countries of tariffs is qu uh, considered to be as well. Yeah. Okay, it you can be, if you go back to the old uh, yeah, old, 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 old uh, treaty, you don't come, you come back to this act. It was a rule of the Act. Yeah. propose a ban on anything <coughs> that can test dumping duties, yeah. which it goes against that. The tariff is a good, is actually a good tool because they can negotiate price and they can test that. So the point I give is that.
Here, this book, yes, I have the book here. It's okay, we take it.
Those are prize you yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.
Okay, I guess uh, we we can start. It's uh, one past two. Um, welcome back, everybody. Everybody, uh, I hope you're probably caffeinated. Actually, you won't need to be caffeinated because uh, this uh, final panel is uh, uh, actually going to cross to cut across many of uh, the conversations that we have had uh, uh, so far. It's the panel on. Uh, connectivity, which just like the Indo-Pacific is another buzzword that has uh, gained relevance, at least uh, rhetorically so, um, in recent years. And it is uh, pretty much par part and parcel uh, of uh, a growing strategic approach. This is the uh, working level definition that we will uh, give to connectivity here in development financing slash uh, investment. Uh, uh, outside of the EU, uh, but also potentially with like-minded partners, uh, quote-unquote, within the EU. And of course, the European Union's connectivity push in the so-called Indo-Pacific is pretty much self-evident uh, from the economic gains uh, uh, that are defining the region. Uh, this is boilerplate uh, statistics. Uh, prior to the pandemic. The region accounts for two-thirds of global growth. And again, prior to the pandemic, 62% uh, of uh, the world economy's GDP. And initiatives, uh, at least announced initiatives, have been aplenty. We've had uh, an EU strategy on uh, connecting uh, Europe and Asia. 
uh, basically the EU-Asia connectivity strategy from dating back from 2018. And then we've had connectivity partnerships uh, with uh, Japan and India. Uh, we will see how these can be fleshed out uh, uh, operationally. And we've had also uh, new incarnations within the G7 with uh, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. And there were earlier incarnations through, of course, the Blue Dot Network, uh, where the EU was uh, uh <coughs> happy with an observant role on uh, uh, really standards uh, uh, specific to government financing, and now the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. Today's, uh, this panel will follow through pretty much uh, the conversations we've had, uh, we've had uh, uh, until now, and it falls pretty much in line with what Professor Kim uh, uh, provided, uh, working definition level, which is, it is part and parcel of the geoeconomic remit of the Union and its member states. It is, in fact, uh, a, willing, uh, a willingness to tap and manipulate, if you want, one's own position within networked economy, within a networked economy, in the pursuit of strategic objectives. And it does hint, as it has been emphasized earlier, at the geopolitical turn um, of the Union and its member states. Geopolitical uh, to the extent that it wants and aims to offer alternatives uh, uh, to China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, specifically to its near abroad and the global south. Uh, but also in terms of really following through the strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which aims uh, at work, uh, working uh, along with like-minded uh, players. Now, to add a layer of complexity, it ought to be reminded uh, that we are living really at a crux of uh, geopolitical transition, but even development financing, has, 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 it has been mentioned earlier, is uh, currently being redefined because resources are more finite and development finance offices have been incorporated uh, with ministries of foreign affairs. I'm thinking of Italy, I'm thinking of uh, the United Kingdom. And they're more tightly knit with investment aims. And in fact, much of the, the development financing uh, and connectivity agenda items uh, are now clearly more uh, uh, working along with public-private partnerships. And there is an interesting link, uh, whereas uh, Europe is becoming more Asian. What do I mean by this? And this is, uh, if you want, my, my provocation. But before the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, much of the uh, headaches uh, within OECD countries in terms of development financing practices uh, came from a fellow OECD player, which was Japan, uh, within DAC, <coughs> where Japan essentially pursued a mercantilist uh, approach to development fin financing in line with its developmental state model, which was exported to our fellow East Asian players, such as South Korea, for instance. And we see this model actually being, uh, oddly enough, uh, being uh, uh, processed uh, and uh, also uh, built upon from European players and American players, we see actually a convergence in the sense that we are playing also this development financing and connectivity uh, game also for mercantile, uh, for mercantile goals. And so you should always take into account that the strategic, the pursuit of strategic ob objectives uh, is not necessarily just a political one, but we should take into, cons into consideration the multiple and interlinked uh, layers specific to investment, trade, exporting of overcapacity, uh, the exporting of norms and standards, and many of these aspects uh, are, tightly, are tightly linked. And if indeed there is a mercantile uh, put angle, the question we should uh, think about uh, during this panel, and I encourage the speakers if possible to, to tackle it, is what degree of cooperation is indeed possible between like-minded <coughs> players precisely because we are at the time and age of uh, not just geopolitical uh, transition but of technological and economic transformation where, uh, of course, uh <coughs> it makes perfect sense uh, to support one's own industries, and I'm thinking of uh, digital industries, uh, green transition industries, when you can gain first mover advantage. And 
that might be at the detriment also of like-minded partners. So what degree of effective cooperation is really possible precisely because we are also getting the head in the headwinds of, as we've uh, heard, of the risk of growing protectionism and of the uh, potential, uh, potential beggar by neighbor policies also among like-minded players. And so with uh, these, uh, with these uh, 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 opening re uh, uh, remarks cleared, I am uh, delighted to have uh, Professor Yevgeny Postnikov from the University of Bel uh, Melbourne. We will follow the order of the speakers uh, uh, in the program. Then followed by Stefania Benaglia, Head of Co Global Connectivity at SEPS, Professor Atsugo Higashino at Scuba University, and Dr. Amaya Sanchez uh, Casiquedo from the European Union Institute for Security Studies. Please uh, give them a, a round of applause and we look very much forward uh, to learn from you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's me again. Um, <laughs> um, double feature, can I have my slides please? Um, and I promise to be um, um, brief um, this time. Uh, okay, so um, so what I thought I was going to do um, in this uh, very brief um, presentation um, is um, connect uh, the two volumes through the theme of connectivity that Julio has just so nicely postulated. Uh, and it prompted me to think just more about, you know, how connectivity can um, kind of connect some of the findings of both volumes, right? So, um, and we've talked about um, for a long time, actually, uh, trying to do something like this, right? To just understand a bit more how the two volumes talk to each other because they are ultimately part of the same larger project. So that's what I try to do here. Um, it's going to be probably a lot of it uh, is going to sound quite abstract because the kind of common findings, right, pulling them together and connecting them uh, had to be done at a kind of um, quite high level. Uh, but I tried also to kind of take that um, and maybe put it a bit more into practice, right, from there. Um, so that's what you're going to see. Can I have uh, my next slide, please? Um, and um, yeah, so first um, I took liberty to summarize the findings of the security volume <laughs> and some of the editors are here so they can correct me if I uh, was wrong, right? And again, uh, it probably excludes quite a lot of interesting, um, uh, interesting observations that uh, various authors of that volume made. Uh, but ultimately I thought what we really see is that um, obviously um, this region, right, Asia Pacific is rife with competition and rivalry and that is increasingly of geoeconomic nature, right? And that's actually what we also see in our volume on trade, right? So both trade and security volumes obviously identify these new kind of challenges and uh, frame them uh, or put them in, into these kind of geoeconomic terms, right? At the same time, uh, the security volume finds that there is lack of coherent uh, strategy from the EU towards Asia Pacific. Uh, there's some cooperation over some security issues, primarily of soft nature, of non-traditional security threats, etc. but overall piecemeal engagement. Right, no, no grand strategy on Asia, unlike some other systemic um, uh, partners, rivals of the European Union. So, so there has been some convergence between the EU and um, uh, those regional powers over some security issues, primarily of soft nature again, um, and kind of on a largely ad hoc basis often. Uh, but um, there's nevertheless uh, persisting um, differing perceptions of uh, just uh, regionalism, um, ambiguity over the appropriate role of the regions. And here we can think about how the ASEAN way differs from the way the EU um, does regional integration, right? How it wants other regions to do it, right? So there are these really fundamental differences between the EU and ASEAN and of course the individual um, member countries, right? And partners in the Asia Pacific. So, um, and last but not least, right? So many of those regional powers are engaged in kind of hedging behavior vis-a-vis -vis the EU and other systemic players in the region. So th this, these are some of the 
kind of findings that, that were screaming at me, right? Uh, next slide, please, um, uh, from the security volume. It's quite, quite a rich volume, and I encourage everyone to read it because there's just a lot more there. Um, and I learned a lot uh, by reading it, right? So now when it comes to trade volume findings, <laughs> well, I already presented those, right, some of them. But again, um, so I talked about how geoeconomic rhetoric supersedes reality often um, in EU um, FTA policy. Our volume is on FTAs, importantly, right? So it's not on trade policy kind of uh, broadly speaking, just on FTAs as an instrument of trade policy and foreign policy, right? So they're not weaponized yet to achieve geoeconomic goals, although the potential does exist, right, um, to exclude rivals through particular designs of FTAs. Uh, uh, Fabian um, previously very uh, nicely uh, illustrated this. Um, so yes, FTAs can be used to pursue relative gains um, and some kind of... Um, security even benefits, right? But often they're not, and uh, there is this general avoidance of regulatory conflicts and competition by the EU uh, in its FTAs. So that means that the design of EU FTAs, the actual design, right, not the potential design, leaves ample room for coordination and cooperation uh, with the regional players uh, in Asia Pacific, but also with, with, with other, with including the systemic players in that region, right? Particularly the United States, but also at times China. And again, FTAs have been used and are used by various countries in the region as uh, sort of a hedging instrument. Um, so that's what we see. Next slide, please. Um, so how do we uh, <laughs> link the two um, volumes and then those, those kind of uh, broad findings, right? So, well, as I said, bol both volumes basically demonstrate that there's ample room for more engagement and greater connectivity on both security and trade, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the so-called um, swing states, uh, right, that are hedging kind of vis-a-vis uh, -vis different systemic players in the region, right? So, and I maybe will try to be um, slightly provocative here, right? And uh, argue that, right, a lot of this kind of geoeconomic rhetoric is uh, put in these terms of economic statecraft, right? And we kind of talk about that in our volume too, and you know, there's a kind of definition of um, economic statecraft, right, is using uh, trade and economic policy, right, to advance state goals, right? So other countries do that, other systemic players do that. The EU uh, lags behind, and I would argue that uh, it should probably not even move more into that area because it is not a state, right? It is first and foremost a uh, market. It's a market power, right? So. That means that there are limits for the EU of uh, when it comes to economic statecraft. So that's uh, so it probably needs to kind of take that into account and, and and act upon its strength, right? And it's mainly the fact that it is an economic power, right? And it's not a state, and uh, it can only do statecraft, uh, economic statecraft, um, to to a degree, to a, to a degree, right? So what it, what I thought then um, it can do really well is negotiate FTAs, right? And it has negotiated many FTAs in the region. So FTAs then can become the kind of bedrock of the strategic partnership that's lacking with the region, right? So there are already FTAs there. Some are open for renegotiation now. There is ample room for more FTAs, right? There is need for this greater strategy. So um, FTAs, right, and inclusive FTAs. And they can serve both economic and security goals, right? And again, the fact, what, what we find in our volume, right, the reluctance to weaponize FTAs and their rules, right, through kind of uh, exclusionary uh, or exclusive designs, right, for many of those provisions. Uh, that's a good thing, right? That's, so that means that uh, the insistence on multilateral rules, right, in those FTAs can actually serve as an anchor for stability in the region, right? So, so it means this kind of new form of, maybe not new, but at the EU kind of um, um, connectivity, um, right, EU-style connectivity through FTAs, it can be inclusive of third parties, right, uh, through, with whom the EU can coordinate and cooperate more. So it also means that pursuing these kinds of, you know, um, inclusive FTAs, right, um, uh, can, I, can also raise the costs of uh, relative gain seeking for other players. So that's, I think, that's an important strength that the EU has, right, as a market power. And it needs to recognize that and act upon that strength and perhaps resist those pushes for, you know, protectionism, the kind of beggar thy neighbor policies and those kinds of things that Judah, you just very um, nicely outlined because I agree that that's the danger, right? So, so, so in that way, the EU is different from other systemic players, right? And it has this kind of comparative or competitive, I should say, advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis other systemic players, right? Just as, as, as a result of its market power. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and that could be kind of uh, the EU 
style connectivity, right, as a kind of strategy uh, for the region uh, through the FTAs. And here I'm just going to very briefly talk about, so I'm a scholar of PTAs, FTAs, and so just very broadly what we know, right, about uh, FTAs and their design and, and what we can build on that, right, and how uh, we could make a design of FTAs uh, a foreign policy instrument largely, right? Because we kind of talked about in our volume how trade can be used as foreign policy, right? So the security volume talks about trade to some degree, geoeconomics, but there's a chapter on economic securities, right? So, so what we know from the literature, right, on, on FTAs is that the design of those agreements and their provisions is very important, and it, it's important for various policy outcomes, right? So the design mediates policy outcomes, um, and they can, it can foster particular outcomes, right? So, so for example, deep PTAs, right, with various regulatory provisions can actually improve GVC resilience that we uh, worry about in this day and age, right? Because producers, both upstream, downstream, um, are actually interested and invested in maintaining openness, right? So designing deep FTAs with key um, countries in the region, right, uh, can actually foster this G GVC resilience, right? And, and greater connectivity, right? So we also know that FTAs have these network effects, right? So, and I'll show that on the next slide, what the kind of, you know, graphically what that looks right. So, so there are all kinds of diffusion processes uh, happening through FTAs. A lot of it is through issue in linkage, right? So, and the EU, of course, has been quite successful there linking, for example, trade with sustainable development and uh, other kind of non-trade issues. Uh, gender is probably going to come next, right? And um, so, so there's, well, there's, there's a lot of unrealized potential there, but, you know, think about corruption, think about migration, energy security, and all those things that are now finding their ways into FTAs, right? So issue linkage is important, right? And uh, these kind of network effects of FTAs are important, diffusion of certain outcomes, right? So FTAs can in induce socialization among uh, signatories, right? And that can even lead to interest convergence over certain issues, primarily of soft security in nature here, right? And what I'm thinking here, right? Um, linking FTAs with particular issues, right, that are not just trade by trade plus, can, can hel help the EU and partners um, to come to these kind of selective convergence that the security volume talks about, to, can foster more this selective convergence over certain issues, be that energy security or migration, right? So primarily of soft nature, of course, although I think even some kind of harder security um, issues are now linked to FTAs uh, by some players, right? So, so doing that more, doing that kind of smartly can foster um, these kind of um, more interest convergence, right? And because there has been selective interest convergence as the security volume has um, identified. So rejection of ex exclusive design, of course, is very important. So as I've been saying, it can uh, strong sense, sex, sorry, it can send strong signal for preference for multilateralism, right, to um, other players, right, and, and many are interested in multilateralism, right, so um, Sven's presentation uh, was very good, right, but I, th I think there's more to be said there, so like-minded middle powers like Australia are interested in multilateralism, right, so sending strong signal to them through these inclus inclusive designs can be really important, right, as a kind of part of this new strategy, advancing connectivity via FTAs, right? So importantly, I think uh, there needs to be a, a respect for regulatory autonomy um, for those partners, right? So the EU, and, and I think some previous speakers were saying the EU shouldn't really, uh, I think it was mainly went to, uh, should not uh, just push, right, and, and uh, uh, demand, right, countries to um, adopt certain EU policies, regulations, right, and if they don't, right, uh, this kind of hard conditionality. That can be risky, right? Uh, so regulatory autonomy is important, we know that, right, that can actually uh, make FTAs more popular, um, uh, and that can also appease internal opposition to further FTAs in the EU, right, and there has been a lot of opposition, and uh, that's something the EU also has to deal with as it's trying to negotiate new FCAs, how to appease internal opposition, how to bring on board the, your partners in the region, but also appease internal opposition, right? Regulatory autonomy might be really important there. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is just what I mean, I guess, by these network uh, effects of <laughs> PTAs, right? So our, our FTA, right? So the EU is a very important node in that network, right? And here it's really the hub and spoke model, right? So um, yeah, there are all sorts of uh, interesting processes happening within this network. And that's what we mean by this network power, right? To going back to the sort of previous panel, the questions we were getting there, right? So um, next slide, please. And that's going to be the last slide, really, right? So there's a lot of potential that can be really realized, right, in the region via kind of fostering this con connectivity uh, through FTA, right? So first of all, great potential for new FTAs, right? So uh, with other countries who don't actually have that much appetite for protectionism, unlike some countries in the global north, unlike some 
uh, even the EU, right? There's strong protectionist demands there, right? So now many of them also have experience with mega FTAs now, with CPTPP, with RCEP, right? So uh, ASEAN plus three, right? So that, that that's, that's a great experience, right, <laughs> that those countries have had, right? So, um, and uh, again, so the EU would be really, uh, it would be wise, right, to connect more, right, with uh, both CPTPP and RCEP partners, right, identifying perhaps where some of those rules overlap, right, where the EU could kind of, you know, foster those more kind of uh, inclusive uh, design ba designs based on uh, multilateral rules, right? So of course, you know, ASEAN FTA has a, a question asked to, uh, um, the keynote speaker, right? So um, I think, yeah, there needs to be um, uh, emphasis on, on uh, EU ASEAN FTA, right? And uh, uh, I think differences could be overcome there, right? Again, many of those countries in ASEAN have negotiated those mega FTAs now, right? So things are different now from what they were even before, let's say, RCEP um, uh, was um, negotiated, right, and uh, concluded. So uh, again, Indo-Pacific <laughs> is the kind of <laughs> emerging theme here. Um, I think, uh, th again, ample potential there. There can be an economic dimension added to the Indo-Pacific strategy of the EU, and I don't see it there just yet. So here, perhaps, the EU could draw on the example of uh, IPEF, right, so in the US, and but do it, again, differently through its own kind of style, right, because IPEF is quite exclusive, right, but that's actually not necessarily the view, right, of those countries participating in IPAF, including Australia, for example, right? So who, who, who want more kind of inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific, right? So again, there's great room for coordination with like-minded partners there, right? And, and finally, the opportunity uh, that emerges at the renegotiation of existing FTAs, right? You can link then new things, new goals, right? Uh, um, uh, as these opportunities for renegotiation of existing FTAs arise. So next slide, and that's the last one, it's just a graph here showing the kind of, you know, more dynamic picture, right? So you have now CPTPP and RCEP, right? But you have kind of aspiring applicants there, right? So it would be wise for the EU to kind of move into that space and uh, negotiate some of those agreements, which it already has, let's say, with New Zealand, right? Singapore, Vietnam, right? But you have Brunei and Malaysia and, um, yeah, and uh, Indonesia, obviously, right? And, and Thailand, perhaps, um, in the future. So thanks. Um, Thank you very much. So um, I will actually try really to be brief because I like also indeed to, you know, one, I stick to one message, but I want it to be clear and that you go away with it. And my message I'm gonna tell you beforehand so that, you know, and then I will, you, you know what to expect. And my message, and thank you for your question, you know, what degree of cooperation is possible with like-minded partners in the, especially in the digital domain? and is exactly into that, replying to that question, is that the EU has an opportunity through connectivity to actually increase its actorness in the Indo-Pacific. And the highest potential is through trilateral cooperation, especially with Japan and or with or in India and in ASEAN. And the digital domain, because of course you highlighted the competition, which is an area of it, but you also have standard setting, interoperability and complementarity. And that actually weighs for me more. So that is why I think that trilateral cooperation actually has the highest potential. So now let's go into a little bit the definition of connectivity that I will use, which is the one that the EU adopts, um, which is in a way a new way of doing foreign policy. And what I mean with this, foreign policy has been traditionally done with public money is you know institutional money that is implemented somewhere but what they're trying to do with connectivity now with global gateway is actually to bring private public partnership in so uh, this is new for the eu it means that the eu has the strategic lines the strategic objective identifies it and then ask pretty much the private sector to chips in and put in the capital which necessarily is impossible for taxpayers money to be there because we're talking about amount of money that no public institution in the world, not even all of them combined, could they ever actually confront the challenges that are, in f that are over there. So only through the creation of a different ecosystem where you actually have a return on investment, you can actually start entering into this discussion. Otherwise, it's literally a lost call to begin with. So this is why I see connectivity 
as a transforming way to do foreign policy and what is actually indeed the EU trying to do. Of course, with all the challenges that it has. Now, I understand and I acknowledge, and before we already had a sense of this you know, um, debate, is uh, connectivity for the EU foreign policy or is it development policy? And for me, clearly is a foreign policy tool because it has strategic engagement in it, which are clear cut. But I acknowledge that this is clearly not the only view, not only externally, but also internally. We have seen, you know, to, talking about what is going on within the EU, that the shift moving away from the EAS having the lead uh, on Global Gateway and on connectivity and entering the house of development, INTPA, we have seen a little bit of change in mentality there. And this shift is actually still ongoing, so we don't have yet the full breadth of what is happening over there. But this, again, for me, the where the real potential is, is using connectivity as a foreign policy tool. And this is where I would like to stick to my presentation. And this is, and uh, this morning, um, you mentioned it, Dean, uh, when Biscop, he, he mentioned the fact that, um, framing it in a way as third countries adopting global gateway, uh, of value-based, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the challenge is not on third countries, is actually the Team Europe approach. Again, back to what are we talking about? We're talking about the European business that actually needs to chip in and have and, and follow the, prior, the strategic priorities of the EU institutional leadership. This is where the bulk of the discussion is actually happening right now. How to make it that the French company follows the guideline of settled by Brussels. And this question is very much up in the air still, you know. But w the day when you manage to leverage and tap into the private sector of the EU and the businesses of the EU, then I guess the whole approach will be streamlined and we will see a different situation. It's not that much, again, so much for third countries adopting the uh, standard of EU values versus another standard of setting of values. It's really about how the EU is going to present itself in this, in this way. Of course, then, uh, also because, and this actually make a, a little parenthesis, the EU never had the claim that it is um, versus the notice, notably the BRI. It is complementary, the BRI. And for the same line of thought, it is complementary to other connectivity uh, strategies, be the US, be the G7, be the Japanese, be the ASEAN, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why, again, I see triangulation as really where the real added value of Global Gateway and connectivity by extension for the EU lies. So back again on how the EU defines connectivity it has four pillars. It has the infrastructure, which is the more traditional, you know, bridges and roads, etc. Uh, it has energy, so how to con bring the energy, especially of course when we talk about green energy, that it gets even more interesting from one side to the other one. Uh, digital connectivity, I guess, little need to defining what that is, and people to people. People to people is becoming a catch-all indeed because it comes with the research, it has health, health of course, no need to dive into that. It is booming the whole, you know, the whole realm of health connectivity. And if, in a way, trade has not been traditionally part of um, connectivity for the EU, but we see that it is entering uh, more and more the discussion, and perhaps it is in the people-to-people -people pillar, I don't know where they would put it, but that doesn't really make a difference. Where I would like to zoom in for the purpose of today is actually digital and energy connectivity, because that is also <coughs> where the EU is actually investing. Um, the EU somehow knows that the actual infrastructure um, is a very complicated game. Um, I see that they're investing less into that one, also because there is uh, first mover advantage when it comes to the BRI and so of course you need to build credibility on that front. Uh, on the people to people, they are well established already, the whole Erasmus, the whole Horizon, etc., etc. They're building on it, but I guess um, they don't perhaps need to label it as connectivity, while when it comes to energy and to uh, digital, this gives it a different organic branding. So it's not really doing things differently, but it's simply bringing, um, streamlining the, the action of the EU. That is what is the, the bulk of it. So now going, um, looking at the region, we have a number of agreements in, um, with a number of countries, and I would like to focus on Japan, because that is where um, I think there is really 
the highest potential. With Japan, we have seen that a little more than a year ago, in the one before uh, last summit, there was the establishment of the Green Alliance. During the last summit, we had the establishment of the Digital Partnership, EU Japan, Green Digital Partnership, EU Japan Green Alliance, to tackle, of course, the Green Alliance is to protect the environment, stop climate change, and achieve gro green growth and the EU-Japan Digital Partnership to support an inclusive, sustainable, human-centric digital transformation. And of both, of course, are exactly talking about connectivity. Now, my point is that actually, uh, because again, standard setting, interoperability, and complementarity, which to me are the key words, um, yes, the bilateral cooperation is important, but where you really have even more potential is if EU and Japan cooperate with third countries, and again, India or ASEAN. These are two wonderful examples for this. Now, to streamline this cooperation, again, on um, digital cooperation, one very useful tool would be the Trade and Technology Council. Uh, the EU established one, what is it now? It must be a year and a half, a little more, with the US. Um, and the priorities that are listed with the US are exactly already included in the EU-Japan Digital Alliance. So there is little work to do there. There is simply, this would be a tool to further streamline their cooperation and ideally, again, in view of implementing it in third countries. That's how I would see this tool. Um, it did, by the way, also establish a TTC with India um, last April, but again, we don't know yet exactly what this TTC will do because we only have the high level announcement, but we don't have the mandate, so we don't know exactly what it will do. So, um, yeah, talking about, again, what the EU Japan are already doing, included in the Digital Alliance, there is a lot of potential, but again, standardization, interoperability, and complementarity. I'm sorry to repeat these keywords, but to me it really are, you know, once these three are clear, you really understand better, you know, it is clear how to, to, to implement this. Um, and, yeah, so, um, why ASEAN and why India? Well, India kind of like is a self-explanatory story for me, <laughs> maybe because I've been studying India for a long time. It is such, an, it's a country such important uh, geostrategic today even more than yesterday, tomorrow even more than today. We have a number of initiatives ongoing already bilaterally. Uh, there, is, there are also, equally for the EU and for Japan, um, very good strategic partnership with India because Japan has an equally good partnership with India than what the EU has. And also Japan and India are already, uh, already established um, forum to co coordinate together in third countries. Let's think about uh, Africa, Asia growth, um, growth corridor where they indeed are, have been thinking how to act together in Africa. And Africa could be exactly the perfect place for um, EU, Japan, and India to act together in a third country. But Japan, it, uh, sorry, India itself could be very interesting for both EU and Japan cooperation because India itself has a lot of potential for all sorts of projects that the two want to do together. And same goes for ASEAN. Now, it, we will have in a little more than a month, we will have the first EU ASEAN uh, summit happening here in Brussels, the 14th of December. Uh, that really is important for the EU to show that the EU is not only a development provider, but is actually uh, an actor, a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific, something indeed, it's a message still to be sent. And um, more importantly, there is an opportunity there with a timeline, which is the master plan for connectivity of ASEAN, which will uh, come, you know, it, uh, will um, expire in 2025, so they will have to renew it. And that is a perfect opportunity to instill, again, interoperability and complementarity. Because, again, the whole point is not to ha adopt one model or another model, but to instill complementarity within the model so that tomorrow, when the opportunity arises, we can actually work together. So with this, I leave you with a little bit of uh, self-promotion because we just published an article detailing a little bit more of exactly what I said, which you can find in the website. Uh, it's co-authored with uh, my colleague uh, Fanny Sauvignon and Rosanna Fanny, who is not in the room today. So I invite you to, to read it for more details. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. My, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Asuko Higashino, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, today I'm speaking about EU-Japan connectivity specifically, and uh, I'm talking about the potentials for revitalization and utilization for the uh, using this connectivity uh, framework in order to, for the reconstruction of post-war Ukraine and East Europe. Okay, so could you move on to the next one? Um, before the start of the, <laughs> yes, before the start of the, uh, this um, um, conference, uh, Julio kindly shared us the, uh, his um, article, and uh, uh, he uh, asked us to consider the definition of this connectivity, and then I fully agree with that. So let, let, us, ha let us have a look at this. Uh, Julio's uh, definition. Connectivity is a vague buzzword, the definition of which ranges widely from strategic investment in infrastructure for geopolitical and economic purposes. So I do agree, and for, I myself focus on this the strategic investment in infrastructure for geopolitical reasons, not uh, uh, you know, to, to, to the less and to the, to the less extent, to the economy purposes, to initiatives to aim at deepening human-to-human -human, uh, interaction, and um, he mentioned also from extra EU to intra EU connectivity. And this time, of course, I'm focusing more on extra EU issue. And uh, he, he, very importantly, he touched upon the uh, uh, this following very uh, important phrase, this, uh, his article follows the international strategic declination of the, uh, connectivity and he presents that you know, uh, concept very, very persuasively. And uh, my fo focus is that while I do agree with this uh, inevitable tendency of international strategic declination of connectivity, I do would like to raise upon the issue that the, whether we can still make the use of this connectivity in order, particularly for the reconstruction of Ukraine in Eastern Europe. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So the, the background. So my main argument is that in trend, uh, 2000, uh, many initial or early ideas and attempts and end debates for Japan to actively engage in connectivity-related issues in Eastern Europe. And uh, but at the same time, every single time the EU was designated in Japanese discourses as potential work partner to work with. But, and so I'm going to explain a little bit about some examples of the, uh, this the early idea of connectivity, which is not designated as connectivity, but the uh, basic idea is actually the same. But, and uh, in 2015, more specific focus on the issue of connectivity and, uh, and uh, more specific focus in infrastructure. Uh, and uh, also, so, uh, may, uh, uh, and, uh, once again, I would like to come back to Julio's um, definition of the uh, strategic investment in infrastructure. So once again, geopolitical purposes. So it is the, the main idea was to compete BRI uh, so we didn't really have Eastern Europe or Russia in mind at that time. But in 2022, a very new context arrives, which is Ukraine. So new strategic importance of connectivity arrives as well. So linking infrastructure, build, uh, building with post-war reconstruction in Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Uh, this uh, uh, discourse is, uh, discussion has just started in Japan, but they, it is too early to, to talk anything substantial about this. So I'm going to talk about the uh, potential of that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So I'm going to skip this um, Eurasian diplomacy because uh, I think it is a very, very early idea of the uh, Japan's connectivity issue vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Eastern European countries. Uh, uh, but uh, the main uh, focus was uh, Russia and Central Asia and Caspian Sea NATO states. So even though it says Eurasian diplomacy, uh, it doesn't really specifically state anything about Eastern European countries. So, it, but they are, uh, the next slide is more important in terms of the connectivity issues. Uh, uh, next one, please. Okay. The, uh, so 
this one actually is the, uh, 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 the concept which is called Arc of Freedom and Prosperity, uh, which was uh, presented by uh, Taro Aso, who was the then Prime, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2006. So when we have a look at the, uh, this concept in a close uh, uh, way, uh, I think that many of the important uh, elements of the connectivity already appeared in this um, concept. So it is a value-oriented diplomacy, and uh, the basic target is um, Central Asia, Caucasus, Turkey, Central and East European countries, the Baltic countries at that time, because uh, at, at that time the EU has just um, achieved the enlargement, and uh, it is preparing for the next enlargement for Romania and Bulgaria, and to the uh, Croatia as well. So, uh, so it was really targeting the wider uh, Central and East European countries and East European countries as well. So uh, it, it had EU and NATO in mind in order to collaborate with, uh, to do anything about this, uh, these countries. And uh, so uh, it's brought in Guam nations, so for example, Georgia, Ukraine, and Belgium, more Moldova. And also uh, people forgot about this uh, actually framework, but the Community of Democratic Choice, uh, CDC, which, you know, or what, um, become a, a talked about uh, just for a little while, every time about the uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries and Baltic countries as well. The Baltic uh, Black Sea region, the Caspian Sea area. So I think uh, the main idea was already there in order to have um, a connectivity issue vis-a-vis -vis Balkan countries and uh, Central and Eastern European countries. But it didn't really work, so please go to the next slide. They, I explain why. And, uh, uh, well, before explaining the uh, situation in Japan. Uh, so uh, if, the, if Japan could have uh, seized the moment properly, uh, it could have a very good collaboration with the EU because it, what the EU was doing at that moment was that uh, in 2000, from 2002, 3, 4, the EU, uh, as everybody not here, uh, it constructed wider European wider Europe concept and the European neighborhood policy. And uh, from 2009, it started Eastern Partnership vis-a-vis -vis six countries in the Eastern European countries. And also it had association agreement with Big Cry, Moldova and Georgia in 2017. So uh, if the, the EU was actually uh, doing these things in a more concrete and practical and down to earth way. So why couldn't Japan, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Why couldn't Japan uh, uh, actively and effectively collaborate with the uh, uh, Jap uh, EU in this area? So, um, because uh, in the hint side, it could have been a joint framework called the Arc of Freedom of Prosperity and the ENP and EAP if the, uh, you know, the uh, communication worked well, uh, if the uh, political willingness to make any sort of um, uh, joint project for that was working well, but it didn't materialize. So uh, I go, I, I'm going to have a look at several reasons for that. For example, the first reason is that the inactiveness and ineffectiveness of Guam or community of democratic choice. So it was very, very difficult to strengthen the ties of, with this framework in Japan. And the uh, EU didn't really s s consider that this Guam and the community of democratic choice per se was a very important partner to work with at that time. And of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, common uh, and the uh, coherent program programs for uh, uh, arc of uh, free them and prosperity because uh, um, it has a very strong image of being a project unique to uh, Mr. Asso. So uh, it was not properly handed over to the next foreign minister and uh, it didn't really have a wider context and a wider impact within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, also area of assistance was really unspecified. So it is a vague sort of framework. So the, the concept would itself was not too bad because it, uh, it tried to have a wide webs of cooperation within that area. But obviously it, it was a missed opportunity for Japan and the EU to collaborate with this uh, very early issue of connectivity. Next slide, please. Okay, so in 19... 
Uh, so the uh, uh, so that we are moving to the second stage, of which is now 2019, uh, where EU Japan had a, uh, a SPA uh, between the two. So it, uh, it provisionally entered into force in first Jan uh, February 2019. And uh, next slide, please. If you have a look at uh, next slide. Uh, thank you. So I, it is the capture uh, from the website of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And if you have a look at the, the outline, it has so, so many um, areas and subjects and targets that the Japan and EU had to deal with within the framework of SPA. So as you can see, if we have this many, uh, we don't really have a concentrated and uh, very uh, specific sort of uh, census purposes. So it just invested everything that we take and do it with. So uh, it, I, I am, uh, have a very critical view concerning the uh, SPA issue. Uh, so it didn't really materialize the uh, very concrete uh, project so far. But uh, it was kind of, next slide, please. Uh, it was complemented by the partnership. Uh, so here we go. Uh, we are talking, uh, uh, at, at last, talking about the disconnectivity issue. So the, it is a partnership of sustainable connectivity and quality of infrastructure between Japan and the EU. So it is narrowing down There's so many topics and subjects which is listed in the framework of SBA. And it is, of course, more specific. Next slide, please. And um, so uh, I, I think it uh, slimmed down uh, very considerably, if you do have a look at that. So it is the shared value, quality infrastructure, and the belief in the benefit of level playing field. And uh, next one, please. Uh, so uh, it is the old dimensional connectivity bilaterally and multilaterally, digital transport, energy, and people-to-people -people exchange, the, the four pillar that Stephanie already talked about. And, and uh, also their physical capacity and debt sustainability and synergy and complementarity between the necessary cooperation and connectivity and quality infrastructure. And uh, it's uh, specified the uh, targeted area, such as Western Balkans, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, in the Pacific, and in Africa. And uh, in, uh, in reality, the, uh, uh, some projects in Western Balkans uh, had some fruits, but not in the other area at all, I have to say. Uh, in particular, in Eastern Europe, we didn't really want anything at all. So that is the uh, big, you know, um, uh, sense of goal in this uh, connectivity issue. But the uh, reality is that we only had uh, several very uh, minor, but they are, of course, uh, it is important, but they are not a, a huge or wide-ranging project within uh, Western Balkan countries. So I'm coming to the uh, last slide of my presentation. So the next slide, please. So it is the uh, um, assumption of the connectivity. It is the area subject to connectivity would be relatively stable. So uh, we didn't really um, imagine this situation that the, uh, the target area of connectivity is uh, in the warfare. So this is uh, something very, very new. So we really have to need to modify the overall uh, strategic you know, purposes uh, in order to match the reality. And, uh, but the, uh, uh, that, that sort of uh, um, uh, adaptation can be quite difficult, I think. And uh, preparation, uh, I think, uh, in order to materialize this Japan-EU connectivity, in particular to Ukraine and Eastern European countries, which is affected by this war, uh, I think we really would like to have uh, two stages, which is preparatory measures in order to materialize the full fledged connectivity. So uh, uh, here we, uh, I uh, suggested uh, just uh, two examples. It can be many, but uh, there are two very important things. Uh, for example, removal of landmines can be very, very important. And uh, Japan and Cambodia has already started cooperation in order to remove landmines within Ukraine. So uh, it started well before the EU and Japan jointly talk about this sort of a very uh, potentially uh, promising uh, project, but the, uh, uh, I think this is the area that Japan, Cambodia, and the EU can expand its imaginary uh, cooperation area. And also reconstruction of basic infrastructure. So well, when we were talking about the uh, um, infrastructure building in the, at the time of the uh, proposal of this um, 
Japanese connectivity. Uh, we were uh, kind of thinking about uh, how to compete the BRI, but the, uh, it, it is the not an uh, issue of competition with China anymore, but the, uh, it is the about the more basic reconstruction uh, of the country, uh, which is damaged by this war. And uh, uh, what we include in this infrastructure is electricity and water and power plant. And uh, also we do uh, need, to have ex need to expand the uh, notion of infrastructure as well, because it has to be agricultural infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, and also educational infrastructure in, in order to build the state's building, state rebuilding uh, at the same time. And uh, if I may come back to the um, uh, questions uh, mentioned by uh, Julia, to what extent the cooperation between the like-minded countries possible. Uh, so I think it is possible, but as I presented uh, in my presentation, we had a number of potential and uh, uh, very promising projects uh, since 2006 or, to, or even 1997. Uh, 90, but the, uh, it, uh, the framework's just there, but we didn't really have a chance to save the opportunity. So I think it is possible, but it is really at the same time difficult to save the right moment for the right project in order, in order to materialize that. So I think it is the, uh, uh, it shows how difficult it could be to work with the like-minded countries because uh, it, uh, probably just because we consider that we are like-minded countries, we don't have a kind of a sense of urgency in order to work with uh, to deal with a particular issue so far. But now in 2022, the things are a little bit different because we are both facing the war in U Ukraine. So I think this could you know, fuel some sort of a um, sense of urgency between the uh, EU and Japan. And uh, I think, um, so we have already um, you know, set a lot of, lot of frameworks, but uh, it remains to be uh, under Utilized. So uh, rather than you know thinking about the expanding this framework, we really need to consider the utilizing the previous and the existing sort of framework. So the, what about the time frame of uh, cooperation? So uh, rather than you know having a long term and very ambitious sort of a, um, uh, frame time frame, so uh, it should be um, reviewed in a very very short period of time. Because uh, 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 when we match the uh, needs for the post-war reconstructions, the needs can be very rapidly and drastically changed in the uh, due course. So, uh, so this sort of a very short, you know, period of time of planning and review of the planning has been not very necessary, I think. So, thank you very much. Thank you. This is working. Okay, so I hope truly last but not least, um, I feel like the last Moikan, close to the finish line. Um, thank you for having me, it's a real pleasure. I'm actually gonna be addressing a sub-region of the Indo-Pacific, which seems not to exist <laughs> from today, which is South Asia. I'm qu quite surprised about this because it's actually in the, in the actual name, um, Indo-Pacific, Indian Ocean at the heart of the region. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so just going from a sort of broader perspective into a, a sort of narrow one, I'm gonna, these are issues we've addressed greatly, so I'll just sort of go very quickly about broader geopolitical and economic context. The question I asked myself when I was uh, invited, because it was initially about EU South Asia, then it was about, literally the next email was EU India. <laughs> I had exactly the same dilemma. Do I need to speak about South, South Asia or is it just really about India? It really got me thinking, so I wanted to include that. Um, I then want to talk about EU and India's motivations behind EU-India connectivity, 
how do they converge and diverge? Um, and finally, implications going forward. Next slide, please. Okay, as I said, these are all things we've mentioned today already, but what I think is very sort of particular to this context, regionally speaking, is India's perception of its strategic encirclement by Beijing along the Indian Ocean. And I think this is nothing new. Um, this whole idea of the string of pearls, I mean, this has been there forever and ever. I think the degree to which it's happening is heightened up, the same way globally there's this perception of a grow uh, growing assertive China, and not to confuse things, I'll show you a map in a minute. Obviously, the Sino-US rivalry, following a competition narrative, again, um, where do India and the EU stand, respect to the stand, sorry, respectively? Is there a third way, as uh, we've discussed today? Need not be only about competition, can it be about competition and cooperation? Russian war in Ukraine, which in a way I think has also sort of brought to the fore this kind of Cold War 2.0 rhetoric, two camps discourse, like-minded versus non-like-minded, which I think is largely convenient for the, the media, for sure, and the policy world, uh, diplomatic perhaps, but not necessarily the reality. And finally, new modes of warfare. And I have to say, uh, the presentation in the morning addressing the sort of new horizons was very interesting in this respect too, right? Um, sort of new frontiers. So in hybrid, cyber, and space, and I would include the issues we talked about in the morning about deep sea and all the rest. Next slide, please. Yes, this is the map, and I really like this map. It's from 2017. It's about Chinese port investments in the Indo-Pacific region. It's relevant to us today for two main reasons, I'd say. One, look at all the different sort of red dots. The, these are alleged civil use ports, some of them dual use ports. I think there's already more little red dots. Um, definitely UAE would be included, Djibouti, as far as I know, being the only sort of publicly recognized um, military base by China. And what I also want to point out is the fact that it's not just about the little red dots and the encirclement in India's littoral area, right? It's also about to the west, meaning Horn of Africa, west of the Middle East, East Africa, the sort of surrounding India, peninsula, but there's also towards Southeast Asia, yeah? So the idea of the Indian Ocean as a much broader strategic space than what's perhaps perceived. Next slide, please. Now, um, because, sorry, I should have said this before, but my own perception of connectivity is about in fact, both geoeconomics and geopolitics coming together, right? Geoeconomics being the use of economic power for strategic purposes. This is why I thought we needed to really have this broader picture. So clearly the burgeoning of connectivity initiatives across the Indo-Pacific and beyond, let's not forget that, Russia, South Korea, Iran, Turkey, so many other countries have connectivity initiatives, yeah? It's not just about the Indo-Pacific. Preference for minilateral, plurilateral arrangements we've spoken a, a sort of at length, uh, where security and commercial sort of coalesce. We didn't talk about the Quad so much today, I'm surprised, um, but also, so, uh, sorry, strategic partnerships, particularly trilateral in the case of India, for example, where it's India, uh, Japan, US, in the India, uh, Japan, Australia, for example. Mushrooming of mega trade arrangements, we spoke about at length against the WTO regime, and of course, the these kind of buzzwords, but I do think they're there for a reason, um, emphasis on economic security and economic sovereignty. Next slide, please. Now, again, going back to this dilemma about should I just go into the, all the different South Asian countries or to only talk about India, when I looked at these data, World Bank data for sort of uh, size of the economies of the region, it was quite clear to me that India obviously stands out. India is by definition, a massive economy, the largest in the region, and will be, estimatedly, the largest, the most populated country in the world by 2023, allegedly surpassing China. So clearly its um, sort of potential and relevance is, is there. Ne next slide, please. Now, again, putting things in context, regionally speaking, the forecast for India, according to national statistics and the World Bank, Calculations is rather positive for the sort of downfall 2020 over the pandemic. If you look at other countries in the region, these are all, again, World Bank data. Um, it applies largely to the Maldives, which gave a huge jump 
2021 post-pandemic. Bangladesh, these are all service-based economies, not so much to Pakistan, <laughs> and definitely not to Sri Lanka and Bhutan. So this is another, I didn't know, there was not enough space, I thought, but there was a very interesting um, da data on the sort of South Asia, kind of economic as a region evolution throughout time, and it was literally up and down, up and down, right? So that's when you get the aggregate data, the region. Okay, next. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the actual evolution, again, these are all things we've sort of mentioned throughout the day. There's clearly, in the relationship between the EU and India, finally I did choose, choose to go for India. I <laughs> didn't see any other way. Um, by the way, I think it could be interesting to have this same session with sub-regions. This could be interesting. Um, so, historical emphasis on trade and economic cooperation, this is clear. Um, with launching off FTA talks very early on, as far back as 2007, yet very little progress. 2013 talks were sort of pretty much put on a halt. Um, with a decision to revive them as an FTA, negotiations after May 2021. Um, EU is in just the third largest, sorry, trade partner. We only take goods into account, number one. Um, if we take goods and services into account, it's the, India is the EU's 10th largest trade partner and currently a leading foreign investor in India as well, the EU. These are all DG trade data. Next slide, please. Oops. Sorry, there's the animation. Yeah, can you press many times? I had put in animation and I had to take it out because the system, thank you. No, yeah, that's fine. Okay, now, in terms of the revitalization, as we would call it, an upgrading of the relationship, July 2020 was definitely a landmark point because of uh, the consolidation. There was already an EU-India strategic partnership from 2004, but there was this notion of let's consolidate, move forward, and have an actual sort of more tangible roadmap which broadened the scope and more importantly, brought in security aspects. So this very much pointed to wanting to have a strategic element to the relationship, not just based on economic um, aspects. There was a May 2021 council meeting in Porto with the 27 EU leaders plus India sitting in the European Council, well, meaning meeting, um, where the EU-India connectivity partnership was actually launched, which only otherwise exists for Japan. And as mentioned today, and Stefania, you mentioned this too, um, there was the sort of establishment of the in EU India Trade and Technology Council, which was a massive upgrade in the rela relationship at a very, very high up strategic level. In fact, it was coming directly, apparently from Ursula von der Leyen uh, in the context of the Rezina Dialogue in India, which happens once a year. It's kind of the Indian World Economic Forum. And this is meant to be a sort of umbrella to then include EU India connectivity and then include, a led a theory, the FTA successful negotiations, uh, which are meant to happen by 2023. Okay, next slide, please. Now, what are the EU motivations behind this um, kind of relationship and connectivity partnership? As we already saw from the data, India's a huge trade and a partner already, I mean large for the EU, and has, more importantly, very high invest investment potential. There's also, and this is I think the core, and the most important point really, this broadening of the actual strategic agenda, right? And when I actually had a look at the idea of the connectivity, um, EU-India connectivity partnership, I realized there was already an attempt at sort of identifying flagship projects, which I thought was very interesting. Um, because the other sort of white elephant in the room is the EU Global Gateway. And the big question, as we've already raised too here, is so whatever is already going underway, is this then going to be part of the Global Gateway? This could be development projects, as with go, uh, going out policy of China, which then some of which then became the Brie, some of which didn't become the Brie. I think we're facing a similar sort of situation here. Um, the core focus areas of, of that currently are climate, clean energy, which we mentioned, uh, eco cities, obviously transport of green energy, transport, mentioned the digital economy. And here it's particularly interesting because 
of the need for the Indian government for actual know-how and sort of support in its own digital transformation. And we saw not long ago the Adana project, which is the di digitalization of India's national ID. Can you believe the scope of such an initiative? <laughs> so there's lots of room for maneuver and I think support in that respect. People to people, we mentioned already. And again, very importantly, security cooperation. Um, linked to, I'd say, softer but perhaps not so soft security issues, such as maritime security, um, disaster relief, for example, crisis management, and sort of more along those lines. Again, this is specific to the EU as an institution, which need not be the case for EU-France relations or perhaps EU-German relations. Yeah? India is a key strategic like-minded partner in inverted commerce. Um, why? Because it is clearly a counterweight to rising and assertive China. Two, and again, I want to emphasize this point because we really truly need to look at the map more, right? It's geostrategically located between Eurasia, East Africa, which for the whole sort of Atalanta operation, and this cooperation along Paris levels, for example, that has been crucial. Western Middle East, very important, and Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. What are India's motivations in the partnership? Now, uh, for a while now, Modi, the Modi regime, after coming to power, 2014, being re-elected, 2019, <coughs> sorry, has sought to stand up to Beijing by really sort of containing, right, its connectivity potential. Again, keeping in mind that India is literally surrounded by countries that have signed, sorry, I'm also under the weather, I also have a cold, um, the re-related MOUs with China. Now, India realizes very well that the EU has expertise in clean energy, digital transformation, and there is already a sort of, I think, a notion or attempt at one to, to tap in more in, in know-how and data protection and digital security issues, cyber particularly. Finally, um, India pursues a multipolar, multi-alignment foreign policy and in a way, the EU could feed into this growing strategic space if we see the Indian notion of the world as sort of multipolar, right? Different poles. So India is also wary of this idea of the G2, China, US, right? It's not very fond of it either. <coughs> Sorry. I, am, I think I may take some water. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Now, on convergences and divergences, this is a bit reductionist, but... Uh, Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, so on convergences, um, again, the broader geopolitical and geoeconomic alignment, this idea of this third way, right? Where do they position themselves in the broader US-China rivalry? Is there such a thing? Uh, hopefully, yes, they can align. <laughs> um, both have a very strong interest in broadening the strategic aspect of the agenda to include security-related topics, as mentioned. This may sound counterintuitive or perhaps contradictory, but I do think the fact that they align on somewhat protectionist expectations and mutually sought after strategic autonomy is goes in their favor in that, in a way, they do have similar interests, even if this they eventually will have to sort of be polished. Sharing normative views on connectivity, on rules-based order, inclusiveness, openness, and environmental protection. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, on divergences, and this is where the crux of the matter comes, definitely standard setting and regulatory issues. You pointed to this also, Stefania. Um, and generally, in this trade regime, its own regulatory environment are restrictive to market access and otherwise. India will prioritize internal connectivity, domestic and security concerns over mercantile aspects. India definitely seeks a global leadership role. It wants to become a net security provider in the Indian Ocean. The question is, how does the EU, if at all, fit in there? Considering the degree of lack of strategic uh, aspect of the relationship as it stands. India's ambivalent policy towards Russia following the Ukraine war. Again, 
I do think, because this came up when you asked this question um, on like-mindedness, I think it is needed to be sort of aligned in terms of values-based like-mindedness. However, it's not enough. I do not think it's enough. Um, and this is proof of it, right? The suspicion along the like-mindedness. Why? Because at the end of the day, India relies heavily on Russian arms imports. Uh, it was up to 62%, according to SUPRI data, until 2017. Now it's gone down, I think. And energy flows. Next slide, please. I thought this was just interesting in terms of data, Indian views. Um, on the one hand, the variable of trust, I find, also hasn't come up so much today. Um, and you see that all, oops, the different players. I don't know if you can see that. But basically, the EU does not have an issue of distrust. Uh, China does, definitely. <laughs> but there are other countries who have higher levels, in, according to the Indian youth. But more importantly, the sort of circle gives us an insight into the Indian strategic community's view of India's most important partners on global issues. And there, clearly, the US sort of takes the bigger part of the pie, right? Followed by Russia, Japan, and to a much lower scale, China and France. Can you see that? Yeah. I'm finishing. I'm finishing. OK. Last uh, slide going forward. Um, I would argue that there's a need for a gradual, step-by-step -step approach in, again, trying to bring in this strategic dimension, not rushing too much, but definitely sort of at least having some kind of tangible steps or flagship projects that one can actually sort of um, present to the world. In line with what Stefania was saying also, this idea of triangulation, implementation, sorry, of um, joint regions of interest need not be Again, let's not forget the position of the India, South Asia, and the Indian Ocean, right? It can be vis-a-vis -vis Eurasia, Southeast Asia, Africa. And I also gave the example of the Indian-Japanese Asia-Africa Growth Corridor as something to sort of work by. And finally, um, this could be a bit controversial, <laughs> but I think there's a need to be more pragmatic in terms of actual alignment and on-the-ground action. And again, as I said, values-based is needed, but perhaps not sufficient. So I think we have to sort of uh, have both partners align also strategically speaking. Thank you. Thank you. With uh, Stefania's and uh, Sepp's consent, uh, we are going to uh, extend uh, this session by 10 minutes. We'll uh, close by uh, 20 past. I'll uh, recap very briefly. We have touched on uh, really an expansive uh, uh, and uh, you could say panoply uh, way of defining connectivity from uh, a transformational new foreign policy tool, really, to uh, where you have clearly seen also, as hinted by Stefania, not the merging of the development uh, financing goals with uh, um, um, uh, the uh, uh, strategic, if you want, uh, uh, planning uh, and ministries of foreign affairs that you see in Italy or in, uh, in, in, uh, in the UK, but actually a contestation between the agencies that we are witnessing still at play in Brussels. And we've had a, um, another definition of connectivity pertaining to, in fact, uh, FTAs, um, <laughs> the real connectors, uh, if you want, and the real leverage that the European Union has, which is market access, which is particularly relevant uh, if we think of the fact that other uh, big players, such as the United States, no matter the IPEFs, uh, uh, the many IPEFs that have been launched, the uh, United States has effectively abandoned uh, the free trade li liberalization agenda. And so that is a space for the EU, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, to occupy in terms of offering uh, market access in exchange for, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, security, economic considerations, uh, or connectivity considerations, if you want, uh, if not, in fact, to ameliorate uh, uh, the disconnectivity agenda that is at play elsewhere in the world. And then we've had another way of looking at connectivity <coughs> by looking at the cooperation uh, in third parties, uh, notably with Japan. I'm uh, delighted to see that Japan, a key player, has been brought up to the fore uh, uh, not just as a role model, but also as a potential partner for cooperation in third parties, notably uh, potentially South, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, India, but even uh, uh, far away in the eastern shores of uh, the African continent. But uh, more interestingly, I'm very thankful for 
the uh, uh, potential for cooperation in the economic reconstruction of Ukraine, which of course uh, uh, will be part and parcel also of Japan stepping up its game in, uh, in the defense of the so-called rules-based international order uh, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and makes, uh, it, makes perfect, uh, it makes perfect sense. Um, and um, I am uh, uh, delighted to see that uh, India has finally emerged uh, uh, in a conference devoted also to the Indo-Pacific because it, it makes it makes the uh, it makes uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, first part of the world. And of course, uh, as the last presentation and Stefania's presentation has emphasized, India is important also because of its economic uh, potential. And so the uh, twin uh, uh, agenda, connectivity agendas of a green and uh, technological uh, uh, digital transformation are aimed at both strategic, uh, narrowly defined uh, aims, uh, uh, but also at economic ones. So, with this variety, really, of very rich uh, presentations from a stellar panel, I invite uh, uh, you in the reminder 10 minutes to uh, take the chance to comment, uh, ask questions, uh, and I look forward to, to fruitful discussion. Yes, we have one, and uh, please do raise your hand. So, Professor Kim, and then uh, the uh, speaker of the second row. Thank you very much. Um, so, I have a question for Evgenia and Johan, and then I have a question for Amaya. So, Evgenia and Johan, so now that you've done this tome, right, uh, and you've talked a lot about design of FTAs, right? I'm just wondering whether you, given you know what you have now observed in the chapters, is there are there any design areas where the EU has more network power. Right, that's one. Um, question for Amaya. It, I think it's so interesting um, to, to see India, how it has behaved in this Indo-Pacific sort of framework, right? So with the RCEP, it walks out of the negotiations in 2019, so it doesn't participate in the RCEP. Um, Indo-Pacific economic framework, it has opted out of the trade pillar, so it's not participating there either. And I just learned today that the, you know, the FTA with the EU is, is stalling. So when you talk about a third way for India, is it about going it alone, maybe? Um, um, or you know, what, how do you see it going, it going alone? So definitely on trade, it seems like it is. Yet um, the other contrasting behaviors that within the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, it's like the second largest borrower, right? So these sort of uh, behaviors are interesting, and I wonder, given your research, what you think sort of this third way of India looks like moving forward. Thank you. We'll take another question. And another one. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to just uh, give a quick uh, comment. Uh, mainly the U.S. Uh, approach to shape the environment around the China uh, on uh, trade on trade matters. So we see, as you said, uh, uh, many, many FTAs, big uh, plurilateral trade agreements and also non-traditional uh, trade cooperation, such as uh, the IPEF. I personally uh, question this uh, approach because given the fact that uh, China is the top trading partner of many countries in the region, and uh, but uh, um, uh, it is to not uh, deny that uh, um, uh, China still has a lot of work to do, for example, to have a level playing field. And uh, uh, given the fact that uh, WTO reform is not uh, moving, not on appellate body, neither on any um, regulatory side of reform. And I think that uh, including China in those uh, mega trade uh, agreements is a way to shape China's uh, trading behavior. Say uh, CPTPP, uh, on specifically this non-commercial assistance clause, uh, if China can come to the table to negotiate, then we will most likely to solve this uh, question of uh, public body that uh, the WTO ASCM is not uh, able to solve. And then secondly, on Taiwan's uh, CPTPP uh, application. Now it is in limbo. I mean, Taiwan is a separate uh, customs uh, territory, but uh, then uh, which one first, uh, China or Taiwan? Or shall we follow the WTO accession protocol? And uh, I, to give an example of uh, a positive effect of uh, negotiating with China, I will cite this case of China-New Zealand uh, upgraded uh, FTA, which 
came into force in April this year. And in that uh, FTA, for the very first time, uh, China and both parties included a public procurement in China's uh, uh, FTA, first time for China. And not only that, uh, not only on the basis of best endeavor. And China actually opened a certain central government entities to the to to uh, New Zealand. Of course, I have not seen uh, what are the covered uh, entities, covered activities, thresholds or offsets. I have not seen that, but uh, this is a good uh, example of negotiating with China to open its market to have a level playing field. And second, uh, very, uh, very, very briefly, and uh, um, you, you said just now, uh, I, I also share with you this thought on consulting local partners. I have a feeling that when I read uh, uh, EU's Indo-Pacific strategy on the trade and economic uh, development part, I have a feeling that uh, the EU is I externalizing its own priorities uh, to the region. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, a short question. Uh, we started off this morning with a lot of talk about bilateral FTAs. It was mentioned even plurilateral, trilaterals as well. Now we are talking about connectivity, but again, bilaterals mainly. And I wonder how far this idea of Bakwati, of the spaghetti bowl of bilaterals, is as well valid for con interconnectivity. And don't we need a global network of co uh, interconnectivity? Thank you. I guess yeah. we'll uh, go in uh, this order. Okay. It's okay. Uh, Thank you. Minutes each. I'm sorry, it's a tall order. W one uh, one minute then. Uh, I completely agree. Just to address this point, uh, that would be the ideal point, and that's again back to actually working with other initiatives. Of course, you can only promote your own because you have your own interest, and that's perfectly fine as long as you maintain complementarity with the others, so that indeed that is the end goal: no interoperability and complementarity. Less than one minute. Okay, thanks for the questions. Um, first of all, Suyeon, um, design where the EU has uh, more network power. Um, which areas, I guess, where we observed it? Um, I, um, I think definitely uh, sustainable development, right? Because uh, so many, uh, well, quite a few, I should say, of those partners were not on the same page, right? But had to come to terms with the kind of EU's um, um, template, right, and, uh, and and adopt, right. So think about Vietnam, think about Singapore, right. So um, and uh, yeah, um, the presentation on the MFN I think clearly showed that there are these network effects uh, there, right. So chapter on regulatory cooperation. Um, uh, by Els de Young and shows that there is um, um, qu quite a lot of that kind of network power there potentially. Um, and um, Jochen could perhaps add to that, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll finish this, um, this round first. Um, so, um, Question on China, I guess, right? So I think, uh, yeah, no, it's a great way to include China, right? To shape China's behavior. I, I completely agree with you. I think just just the remarks that you made. Um, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's quite emblematic uh, the fact that China uh, wants to join RCEP. Yeah, so that's uh, that, um, that's really interesting, right? What you mentioned on the uh, inclusion of uh, public procurement into China, New Zealand, right? Upgraded FTA. That's that that's that's really interesting, right? So. Um, China, of course, has an FTA with um, Australia as well, right? So there's, um, yeah, there's, um, um, I, I agree, that's a great way, right, to kind of uh, shape China's behavior and some of its stances, right, on some of those issues uh, in trade. Um, I'm probably running <laughs> out of time here, but on, 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 on your question, um, global connectivity, um, too much of this bilateral, plurilateral, right? But I think, um, it could lead, right, potentially, right, when there's critical mass of these sort of um, 
countries, right, have negotiated a bunch of these agreements, right, with similar issues. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking about some of those um, sustainable development clauses, for example, right, that were um, sort of not part of the WTO, right? So many of them are part of um, plurilateral, bilateral FTAs, right? Uh, perceptions are changing, right? The ideas about sort of uh, what's appropriate in trade, what's not appropriate are changing, right? So potentially, I, mean, I agree global would be ideal, right? But this could be a start for kind of, you know, uh, potentially then including those kind of uh, clauses globally and perhaps even in the WTO, so um, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, just briefly, you were asking about India's alleged third way. Um, I don't think that's anything new in that India has a history of non-alignment, right, throughout the Cold War, so that's kind of the same old, same old. What is very different, I think, is the current geopolitical context, this idea of the two camps, and also this challenge coming to this post-World War II established order from not just China with much, much more uh, le leverage than the sort of Soviet Union had back in the days, um, but also other multipolar nodes, sorry, <laughs> other rising powers, thank you. Um, so it's the challenges, at a, I'd say, I'd argue, at a very high level. And two, um, in terms of the actual sort of mega trade arrangements, I think those are, there's also internal pressures coming from the sort of domestic uh, regime in India, the Mali regime, and there's also this, for a while now, since 2013, pretty much with the coming to power of uh, Modi, there's this very sort of first India, make in India, this kind of Swadeshi idea of self-reliance. So I think that's that's something that's in a way revitalized. Um, and again, I don't think it's unique to India. I think it's, it's a sort of broader wave. So that would explain the path. for closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep, so I'm not here. Don't worry. I will be very brief. Uh, we just came to an end to a fantastic day. We have learned a lot. We have spent the day hearing about trade priorities from the European Commission, from the Deputy Director of Trade. Um, then we, Director General, of course, sorry. <laughs> we continued by discussing security in the region, including consideration on non-traditional security. We moved on geoeconomics in the region, FTAs and more, and finally came into connectivity, what it is, what is not, and what it can do. So thank you for uh, staying with us today. In case you have missed or you want to see some part of today, the video will be available at uh, SEP's ch channel. And this is actually an opportunity maybe for you to follow uh, more of our, our events. So I would like to invite you to join me in thanking each and every one of the speakers, uh, including the keynote for sharing their insights with us. Thank you for the participants for enduring with us the whole day. And finally, thank you to the organization team, to the EAST project, and in particular to Thomas, who is not uh, physically with us today, Giulio, but also Fanny and Xavier for making today possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania.